Good morning and welcome to our 110th weekly webcast. If this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. If you've been with us before, welcome back. And so the way the call works is it's three hours long. This is an AMA, just like on Reddit. AMA means Matt, ask me anything. You can ask me business questions, personal questions, career questions. And within 24 hours of the call being completed, if you go to the description field of this YouTube video, you'll see that my team has written down all the times that all questions were asked, as well as the title of all questions. So you can click on them and get immediate access uh, to, um, to the answers. And so I can't believe this is week number 110. Um, and one thing I wanna mention is that if you wanna take your career to the next level, uh, our next MBA degree program starts on December 14th. Uh, and you can learn more about this at harunmba.com. Thanks again, and let's get started. Okay, so first up, uh, I've got good morning from Manas. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Noelle is saying, hi, Chris. I hope you're doing well, likewise. Do we really need a team for starting a startup? I had a Zoom meeting with a Stanford student. He told me that you should get a team so that you can make things work faster. Yeah. So I, I, I believe that a small group of people can change the world. Um, I believe if you have too many people in one meeting, it's an absolute disaster. And we all know what that's like when we work in a company or we go to school and there's a team meeting with too many people. Nothing gets done. In fact, at Amazon, what Jeff Bezos does is he's got what's called the two pizza rule. And what that means is no meeting is allowed to take place that requires more than two pizzas to feed everybody uh, in the same room. So small groups of people can and always do and always will change the world. In terms of do you need to hire a lot of people or anybody at all to get started to start a company? Absolutely not, absolutely not. Um, you can start just by yourself and then once you scale your business, then you can look to hire other people. In fact, most people that start side hustles start off by themselves, of course. And once that side hustle makes more money uh, than they're making in their full-time job, then they quit and do it themselves. And then eventually they hire more people. You don't need to hire people right away. You can be a solopreneur. Uh, and I pride myself on teaching all my students how to start a company and run a company uh, by yourself. You know, when I do, I have a great team, uh, but for, for many years, I ran my company by myself. And when I do these broadcasts, um, it's just me in this room uh, by myself. So I, I pride myself on teaching uh, all my students on how they can start their own companies as an army of one. Uh, if you want, you can take my MBA degree program um, and learn more at this website here because I put you through in the third semester, and there's four semesters. In my program, I put you through uh, a venture capital boot camp in the third semester where I teach you how to start a company from scratch based on my experience working in venture capital, working on Wall Street, starting companies, uh, and mentoring many, many students. Uh, I think one person can change the world uh, with a great business model. And you gotta look at what's called marketing automation, uh, meaning what you have to do is, if you can, uh, use as many internet websites or software products to um, replace the job of people so that you don't have to hire more people because labor is always the base expense with startups and all companies. And some of the products you can use in order to scale your business as an army of one that I love uh, include MailChimp for your email marketing list, Active Campaign when you move up upstream and you can't use MailChimp anymore uh, to manage all of your emails. And by the way, all emails that students get from me, I use something called Active Campaign. Um, other products you can use um, are is something called ClickFunnels. And what ClickFunnels does is it creates one web page that will basically funnel all prospects for something you want to buy or you want to sell uh, and get them to pay. And I'll show you what it looks like actually. Um, so I've got I've used ClickFunnels um, on not on my main website, but I use it on my other website, which is harunmba.com. And basically, it's, it's a one-pager. And what it does is it gets people to learn more about your product. And there's many places where they click to, to buy the product or, or whatever it might be, learn more. 
Um, and that button repeats itself over and over again on that one page uh, until finally uh, somebody clicks the buy button or they just go to another website, that, that sort of thing. So in my MBA degree program uh, on at HaroonMBA.com, I give you sample lectures. I talk about everything involved in the curriculum, et cetera. So that's, that's ClickFunnels. And I know it seems strange to do it all on one page, uh, but the reason it's on one page is because it's easier from a coding perspective to get people to jump up and down one page uh, using hash marks within HTML code. Also, it's easier on mobile to load the page as well because once somebody starts reading the top of that one pager, by the time they've started reading the first couple of sentences, the rest of that one website has loaded on mobile uh, where broadband might not be ubiquitous, meaning internet speed might be a bit uh, slower. Um, so you can certainly be an army of one and start your own company that way. Um, and when it comes to marketing your company as a solopreneur, um, I, I have to mention that YouTube is the only search engine in, in the world, or pardon me, the only gold rush in history uh, that costs you nothing to make the product. And YouTube is also the only gold rush in history where you can get immediate access to a gazillion customers immediately for free. And so what I recommend you do, um, if, if you're serious about starting your own company, uh, is have fun with it by creating vlogs and, and then repurpose that content. Uh, and you always have to ask yourself, am I adding value immediately to people watching this vlog? And what I mean by repurposing content is similar to what Nintendo does and has been doing for decades. They make their older 8-bit, 16-bit, and 64-bit Mario games, Zelda games, Pokemon, etc. Then what they do is they repurpose them or reuse that content on future platforms uh, like the Switch or the Wii U before the Switch or the Wii before that or the GameCube before that even. So they repurpose the content um, so that they can work smarter, not harder. You can do the same thing as well. If you host a call like I'm doing here, you can then repurpose the content. You can cut up uh, the, the, the call into shorter videos and repurpose them as YouTube vlogs or, or, or little tweet videos uh, or Instagram videos, which is what I do. Um, what you can also do is you can write a book and anybody can do this and I have a template for you and I don't even need your, your email address to, to get the, the, the book template. You go to my website, which is haroonventures.com slash write book, W-R-I-T-E-B-O-O-K, all one word. And you can download a, a template here. And with this template, it's just a Microsoft Word template. There's one page of instructions on how to get your book onto Amazon Print, Amazon Kindle, Amazon Audible for free. It costs you nothing. And in this Microsoft Word template here, all you do is you, you fill it out in Word, uh, and then you right-click on the table of contents, and you're done. And then you can get your book published. Again, it's, it's free to do. It's free to download um, uh, from, from my website uh, as well. Uh, and so if anybody has additional questions uh, about how to start a company uh, by themselves uh, initially uh, for the pricing point of zero, literally, please let me know because I do pride myself on helping uh, my, my students reach their full potential uh, by starting their own companies or my students by starting different divisions or products within uh, larger firms uh, in general. So anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. Um, and last thing I'll say is when you write a book, and by the way, if you want my networking book for free, you can get it from my website, haroonventures.com. But everybody should write a book. And when you write a book, you become a thought leader. Uh, how do you become a thought leader? You think like one. You know, leaders are readers uh, or writers. Write, you can write your book. And then what you can do is you can gut your book, uh, meaning you take a chapter every week out of it and you paste it into LinkedIn. That's how I got started, actually, with my entire business. Think of your book as kind of a manuscript. You paste it one chapter into LinkedIn every week or little uh, quotable excerpts uh, into Twitter. Uh, and then what you can also do is you can take the contents of each chapter and turn them into vlogs as, as well um, so that you can get free marketing for your business. Because, and the last thing I'll reiterate is that YouTube is the only gold rush in history. It costs you nothing to make the product. And it's the only gold rush in history that you can get access immediately to a gazillion customers for free. Give and you will receive. Help others uh, and it 
it just works out well. It's karma, call it, call it karma synchronicity, call it what you will. Um, if you give, you'll receive. The bottom line is that anybody can start a company. If I can humbly help you, please let me know. Visit HaroonMBA.com to learn how to join my MBA degree program because as part of that MBA degree program, we do have a pretty comprehensive venture capital boot camp to help you get your business up and running. And thank you. Okay. And by the way, if you're rambling when you're answering a question in an interview, kind of like I was right there, you can quickly just say the bottom line is, and then you can wrap up what you were saying. Uh, but just to be intellectually honest, I was, I was rambling a bit there, so that's how I wrapped up my thought process, or lack thereof. All right. Next question is, let me see right now. Casey. Casey is saying, hi, Chris. Uh, hope you're well and having a great week. Likewise, thank you. And by the way, I read every comment here, uh, everything out loud. Uh, and if I miss your question, just paste it again. Please don't paste an internet link, though, because for some reason, YouTube won't allow that message to get through to all of us here. Okay, next question is, um, do the people near you, meaning family and friends, criticize you when you started uh, making videos on Udemy? How did you deal with them? Yeah. Yeah. So family didn't because my parents uh, have always been very, very supportive. I've, I've got awesome parents. I love them. Uh, dad, if you're watching, you're like a father to me. No, I'm just kidding. My, he is my dad. Yeah, yeah. My dad watches sometimes, by the way. Yeah. Um, but uh, I did get criticism from friends. Yeah. Uh, especially in the venture capital industry because I, I quit venture capital to do this full time. You know, I got to a point where I'm like, I just want to do what I want to do. And, and I love teaching. And when one teaches to learn. But what would happen is people would ask me, are you still teaching? I'm like, yeah, this is my raison d'etre, my, my, my purpose in life. Uh, and then what, what happened was I would get calls from other venture capital firms, hedge funds, et cetera, saying, do you want to come back? Do you want to come back to work? And people thought I was nuts. Maybe rightly so. I'm a little bit nutty sometimes, but it's fun. I'm just being me. And then what happened was fewer people started saying, do you want to come back to venture capital or hedge funds after a while? Because I started getting humbly some success doing what I'm doing. Uh, and so whenever you enter a new market, and I still believe it's we're in the early innings uh, or the, the beginning part of the secular growth trend uh, with teaching online. But when people criticize you for doing what you're doing or if they think you're crazy, um, then that's good because there's not many people in the market yet. You know, so initially people like Elon Musk uh, when he started talking about, I want to, you know, revolutionize the electric car market, even though he was not a co-founder of Tesla. People thought at first, he's like, well, maybe he's kind of crazy. Then he got some success. And then people were like, oh, crazy genius. And now he's incredibly successful. Uh, and so people just say genius. It's kind of like if you search for a picture of Albert Einstein and you see that picture with him sticking his tongue out with long hair, you never think crazy. You just see his face. You're like, oh, yeah, genius. And so once everybody thinks that you're not crazy uh, anymore doing a startup, um, then it might be too late. You know, you, you got to strike while the iron's hot and you got to be long-term greedy. And, as, and the last thing I'll say about this, the bottom line is that Wayne Gretzky, the greatest hockey player ever, he said he was successful not because he skated to where the puck is, but rather because he skated to where the puck is going to be. As investors and entrepreneurs, we should start companies or invest in stocks that people are going to like. Because as Warren Buffett said, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. And thank you for the question. Okay. But you will get a lot of criticism. And, and by the way, um, if, you, if you don't get criticized um, as you become more successful, then you're not successful enough. And as Eleanor Roosevelt said, they're going to criticize you anyway, so you might as well do it. And if you care what people think about you, you'll never reach your full potential in life. And most of the best entrepreneurs never never gave a damn what anybody thought of them. You know, they marched to the beat of their own drum. You know, just do what you want to do. Whatever your, your purpose is on this planet, go for it. Uh, and I've got a great quote here from Mark Twain, uh, which is, the two most important days in your life are, number one, the day you're born, and number two, the day you find out why. And if I can humbly help you find your passion career-wise, then I've done my job. And please sign up for my MBA degree program. 
There's a 30 day, 100% money back guarantee. You've got uh, nothing to lose. And I want to humbly help you or your money back. All right. I've got these pedals down here that I press to change the camera angles. Okay. And everybody's got something to teach. When one teaches to learn, and you can go to do a search on my name in Udemy and you can find a bunch of free courses uh, I, I created to help you teach online based on mistakes that I've made over the years. And dude, I've made so many mistakes teaching online. And here's a great quote about failure. Michael Jordan, my favorite quote ever. He said, I failed over and over again in my life and that's, and, and that's why I succeed. Um, so don't be afraid of failure. Embrace it and don't give a damn what people think of you. Uh, if you're not successful, because you only have to be successful in business one time. That's a great quote from Mark Cuban, who's on Shark Tank. All right, next question is uh, from Casey, who's saying, can you recommend any options to be a mini angel investor um, as an opportunity to hear pitches and invest in other businesses, but with a small investment? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, and so what Casey is referring to, uh, an angel investor means an early stage um, investor uh, in a company, like before venture capital firms uh, get involved. Uh, and angel investors usually means a very high net worth individual that can cut you a check for a small amount of money just to get you started. And the way, and I, and I recommend not talking to venture capital firms initially, I recommend talking to angel investors or high net worth individuals. And you can go to my website, haroonventures.com and download my networking book for free. It'll teach you how to raise money. I've raised and managed over $1 billion in my career and I document exactly how I do it in this free book here because relationships are more important than product knowledge and your network uh, is your net worth. Now, in, in terms of individuals investing in, in startups, so I wanna caution you there um, because I care. Whenever you invest in anything, be it a stock, a mutual fund, an ETF, um, a venture capital firm, or a startup, whenever you, invest, whenever you invest in anything, you should be given what's called an offering memorandum. And in the offering memorandum, all the risks are highlighted uh, in this investment. And lawyers, of course, write it. And if you can't get the offering memorandum, and it's called different things in different industries, it's called an S1 when it comes to IPOs. But if you can't get an offering memorandum, then don't invest. And by the way, if you're going to invest in something and you want to put it into your tax retirement savings program so that you don't pay taxes on it until you retire, call your accountant first and ask them if this thing that I'm about to invest in can go into my retirement savings program. It's important you do that for two reasons. Number one, because sometimes if you don't put it in your retirement savings program, which is called something different in every country. In Canada, it's RRSP. In America, it's 401k. In Australia, it's superannuum, I think. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't put it in your retirement savings program right away, sometimes you can't transfer it later. And also, your accountant, when you call them, he or she might tell you, this doesn't look like a good investment. I don't think you should do it. They can help you out in that respect. And nobody should do their own taxes. That's right. Don't do your own taxes. Get an accountant to do it. In terms of how to get a good, an accountant, there's no centralized repository online that will tell you where to get one. You talk, talk to your rich aunt, rich uncle, uh, your parents, somebody successful at work, etc., and ask them to introduce you to their accountant because your accountant will, will keep you in the, within the confines of the law when it comes to filing taxes, if they're good. They'll also be up to date on new tax law changes and tax laws change all the time. And they'll also hopefully be able to, to get you money back uh, if, if, if possible. Like if you're a student or if you're taking courses on the side in some countries, you can write that off. Like in Singapore, you get 500 bucks every year from the government tax write off wise to take courses. So that, that, that's what I recommend. But I, when you invest in startups, it's tough. It's tough. And Many governments will actually protect consumers by saying you cannot invest uh, in venture capital firms or hedge funds unless you're an accredited investor, meaning you have a certain liquid net worth, etc. Be really, really careful 
uh, with investing, please, and start, especially family and friends, okay? Um, if, if a friend of yours or a family member says, do you want to invest in my startup, just politely say no. You know, say I'd be more than happy to be an advisor and help you for free, of course, but no. And the reason is because people change when it comes to money. You know, I've made uh, a lot of my friends money and I've lost a couple of money as well. And they're no longer friends. And going in, I warned them. I said, you know, you, this is, you know, this is a venture capital investment and here's the risks and stuff. Uh, but just be careful with that. Don't, don't mix friends and family with money because money is the root of all evil. And people do change uh, when it comes to money. It's true. It's true. So, um, and just know also that you're going to be a stockholder if you invest in a startup, meaning you're in it for the long run. You might not be able to sell that opportunity for a long, long time. Be careful. The last thing I'll say is this. If somebody comes up to you and, and says, hey, do you want to invest in my startup? I want you to think this, but not say it. I want you to think to yourself, why am I so lucky to be given this opportunity? It might be because nobody else will invest. Always do your due diligence. In my MBA degree program, uh, I teach you how to do a lot of due diligence on companies, including management teams, background checks, etc. Thanks for the question. All right, next up, we got Casey who's saying, uh, what advice do you have for someone who is regularly asked to do free work, like charity pro uh, projects and sit on boards, but when looking for work that actually pays, is told they're overqualified. I hear you. I hear. I've been there. I've been there. Yeah, it, it's tough. It's tough. And and sometimes when people think you're overqualified, uh, it's because the hiring person that you're going to be reporting to might actually feel insecure because they don't want to hire their assassin. You know, not that you won't be nice at work and whatnot, uh, but when I say assassin, I, I'm I'm saying somebody that's more qualified than them. And that's a big pain point that a lot of people have uh, in business. It's happened to me before. It's made me very frustrated uh, to the extent that I, I just, it drove me nuts at work because when you're really good at what you do, sometimes you can you only put in 80%, otherwise you come across as a threat. And what's the point of doing anything in life if you're not all in? Um, and so the way I would deal with that uh, in an interview is if somebody implies you're overqualified, uh, then I would say this. I would say something along the lines of, I absolutely love doing what I'm doing. You know, I, I, I'm not looking to climb through the ranks. There's no hubris uh, or, or arrogance with me. I just absolutely love doing what I'm doing. I'm happy to stay at the same level and do that one task over and over again. Um, and, and I love working with people. I, I humbly think I'm a great uh, team player as well. Um, and if you want, you can call my references to learn more. The bottom line is I'm not looking to advance throughout the company. I just want to do this one skill uh, because it's something I'm incredibly passionate about, which means it's not really work for me. I, I love doing it. Okay. All right. Next up, Pratik is saying, I was shocked to see that your open house went for 13 hours straight. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, 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 and, and then you wrote here, I also feel privileged to be able to be a part of your MBA degree program. Thank you. As I saw uh, that day that people um, who were speaking uh, on, on Zoom were so great. I'm sure that my classmates uh, will be uh, very great uh, when, when, when I join the program. I think you're saying, yeah, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. So for those of you not familiar with what, what, what happened, um, it was, not, I think it was last Friday. Yeah, last Friday, I held a call. And the call was to talk about my MBA degree program, which you can learn about at this website here. And I, I started the call with a one hour free lecture on from my MBA degree program I taught live. Then I brought on one of my students on Zoom. Then I answered questions for five hours like I'm doing now. Then I opened up Zoom and I answered questions for another seven hours uh, and then we kept doing it until Saturday morning. And it, I, I actually achieved humbly my record of 10 hours without getting up once. Um, and I just, I love doing what I'm doing. It's like a kid uh, playing a video game. There's no concept of time. They just love doing what they're doing. And when you have no concept of time when you're doing something, that means you found your passion. And if anybody wants to go and watch uh, a replay, and I, I obviously don't watch the whole thing. No, nobody has time like that. But I'll show you what my team did. What my team did was um, they actually 
uh, put a transcript or, or the clickable questions. Um, and you can go to my, my YouTube channel to, to find this. Um, it's, it's right here. I'll, I'll pause it. But, but we went, um, we went for, 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 yeah, like 13 hours straight. YouTube only recorded the first 12 hours. I wore the same shirt. Um, and then what we did was I, I opened it up to Zoom, which is how I teach my classes as well in the gold and platinum version of, of my MBA degree program. So we had people from all over the world. It was a lot of fun. But what you can do is you can go to the description and you can click to get immediate access to any answer you want to any single uh, question. Um, for example, click here. It'll, it'll jump directly to where I answer that question, et cetera. Yeah, but we, we had a lot of fun. Uh, many thanks to Jason Blythe, my amazing platinum student that joined to take questions from the audience. And also thank you to my many platinum students that joined Zoom. I didn't even ask them to. Um, they were all there and I don't want to mention them because I'll, I'll miss a couple people, but I love my students. All right. Um, and then uh, uh, next up, uh, Manas uh, from India is saying, uh, good morning, my, my dear mentor. Thank you. Good morning to you as well, buddy. I hope all is well. You did an awesome job last Friday at the open house. It was uh, really commendable and you really made it our day. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, buddy. I really appreciate it. It was fun. And thank you for coming as well. You know, I, I, I pride myself uh, by teaching or by, by treating my, my, my students like they're customers. Imagine that, a teacher treating a student like a customer. Somebody buys a product or a service, you treat them like the customer. And that's what I do. And the customer's always right. And a company is only as good as its customer service. And I pride myself on humbly trying as hard as I can to over-service all of my, my customers on my, my MBA degree programs. You can learn more by going to this website. Thanks. All right. Uh, next up is, is Albus who's saying, hey, Chris, uh, congratulations on the open house session. Uh, it was fire. Uh, I got to learn a lot. Awesome. Or you, you wrote, got, uh, you learned a lot. Awesome. Thank you very much for, for being a part of it as well. It was fun. It was fun. I'll do another one too. I, I had so much fun doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's the reason I got this, this monitor behind me here is so that from every angle, uh, when I teach, um, uh, and I do the open house thing, I can not only switch, uh, the images here, but also, uh, there's no glare issues like on, on this angle here, which is a little bit, not a perfect angle. Hey there. And I can zoom in a bit to it as well, uh, as, as well as from, from the, this angle here uh, and then over here as well. There's no glare. There's no glare. Uh, and what I do is I have pedals to switch all the, all the, 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 the cameras, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and I'm looking directly at you through a teleprompter here. So I'm reading the questions as they come live. I also have pedals for when I teach that go between uh, slides and PowerPoint. Um, and I reverse the text so it's white text on black background. Uh, otherwise, uh, what, what appears is a really, really bright image and you can't see me. But I teach you how to be a solo printer and do all this stuff and set up your own studio on the cheap. That's right, on the cheap uh, in my MBA degree program. So thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, uh, next up, um, uh, Manas is saying, uh, you were the only one who taught me ask and you'll receive. So can I please, please, please ask you for something? Sure, I'm here for you. Um, and then you wrote here, thanks in advance. If your answer is no, uh, these are two things I, I need to tell you. Uh, by the grace of God and, and by your love and support, uh, the book is live on Amazon and the news is not over yet. The course is live on you. Oh, good for you, dude. You got it up and running. Good for you. Oh my God, that, 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 that is so awesome. I don't even see your, what your question is here, but I, I'm gonna, let me, let me go and check out your course. And by the way, anybody can teach on, on Udemy. Um, and when one teaches to learn, and the, the, guy, the guy that, there's a guy named Ninja who plays Fortnite and he makes millions playing Fortnite. He started out actually on Udemy teaching how to use Twitch, which Amazon bought for a billion dollars uh, many years ago, uh, which is a great video uh, game platform, streaming platform. So let's go to, I'll just go to udemy.com, okay. And then I'll go to uh, Manas. Roy, whenever I see your name, I always think of Patrick Hua, who's a great goalie from, uh, from, from Quebec. And the complete uh, public speaking course, uh, right, right, the complete 10 in one public speaking course. Very cool, very cool. 
Okay, great. I'll 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 check it out, Manas. Good 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 for you. Let me let me um let me buy this. Um, and, and I'll check it out. I, I always support my students. Uh, and what I'll also do is I'm going to go and buy your book. Yeah. So, um, go to checkout and I will buy this course. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, and, and I'll click buy later because I don't want to share all my credit card information. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Great job. And I'll, and I'll buy your book as well. And I'll bring it here on the air next week too. Thank you. And congratulations. All right, um, then uh, next up, um, uh, let's see what we got here. And if I miss anybody in between, just let me know, please. Albus is asking, uh, can you provide some insights on starting a not-for-profit? And, and I know you um, how you felt uh, being part of the, the Limo Foundation. Yeah, uh, and for those of you not familiar with the Limo Foundation, it, it's something near and dear to my heart. Um, where I live, in the, I live in a, a town called Hillsborough uh, in the Bay Area, and just uh, south of me is a, a place called Shallow Alto, Palo Alto. Uh, and right beside Palo Alto, there's a place called East Palo Alto. And in East Palo Alto, the high school graduation rate is only 40%. Uh, and, so, and there's a lot of deadbeat fathers. I don't personally believe there's such things as a deadbeat mother. And so what we do in the Limo Foundation is we provide scholarships to many, many students for free to go to great private schools. Um, and, and the, these students are from 7 to 18 years old, usually. And, and the foundation picks them up, drives them to school, et cetera. Uh, and so let me, let me show you actually a picture of, of these wonderful students. And, it, and they are the reason why I, I, I do what I do. And, and by the way, quick shout out to, to Brenda, one of my amazing students when I used to teach in universities at night at San Francisco State. She started something called Providing Opportunities for Women, uh, and I served on the board uh, of, of this for a while. I should change this, actually, because I, I recently uh, haven't got, had time to be a part of it. But what Brenda was saying when she presented about providing opportunities for women is how tragic it is that in America, there are more CEOs named John than there are women CEOs. Ridiculous, ridiculous. So um, hopefully things change and, and things are getting better. But here's the Limo Foundation here. Um, and, and so uh, this is, um, I actually, the reason I do my MBA degree program uh, is because of this event here a couple years ago. Um, before I published my entire MBA program on, on Udemy, what, what I actually did was um, I, I taught here on the weekends for free. Let me go back here. And what I did was one day, one day what, what, what I did was I, I, um, I created an event in early 2016 uh, called um, an entire MBA in one day. And it was 12 hours long. And I did it at um, Longitude Capital's uh, headquarters. Thank you, Patrick, uh, for letting us use your office. And, and I taught them. And then I created um, a, a degree for them, which is similar to this degree here, actually. And the genesis for me creating my MBA degree program was, was this. And these students, oh my God, they're amazing. They went from the age of seven to, uh, I think, 17 or, or 18. Uh, and, and Lalika right here, uh, she graduated uh, from, from private school in Atherton. Uh, she went to a great university and she's on my board uh, right now. She's great. But these students uh, had so much fun that day and they're brilliant. And what I did, that was a Saturday in January. On a Sunday, what I did is I put up a camera in 2016 uh, in my house. And I just re-recorded what I taught there in eight hours. I called it entire MBA One course. And it's why I do what I do. And of course, they got all this stuff for free. That's why I started my MBA degree program. This is the genesis. It was never for the money. It was because I wanted to help. I wanted to help. Yeah, so... That, that, that's the Limo Foundation, near, near and dear to my heart. They're, they're awesome. They're awesome, yeah. And if you're not involved with a charity, please start now or start a charity. In fact, if, you're, if you, are, you have the entrepreneurial itch and you work for somebody else in a big company and you want to start a company because there's something deep inside you that wants to come out entrepreneur, entrepreneurship-wise, then what you can do is you could start a charity. And that's what I did. I used to work at uh, Accenture, Accenture uh, back uh, in the 90s. And in 1997, I started CICC.com, which stood for Canadian Internet Charity Consulting. And I would make websites for tons of charities for free. It was so fun. 
And it, it was good for me because, from a therapeutic perspective because I was an entrepreneur deep down inside, but I worked at a big company at the time, which kind of drove me crazy. It is, it is what it is. Um, now, CICC.com, I let it go. Uh, the, and I wish I didn't because it's now the largest Chinese investment bank yeah, owns that. But you can go to an internet archive service and search for CICC.com and see my cheesy website from the 90s. Okay. All right. And by the way, if you're curious about how a company got started uh, and what it looked like in the early days, and if it's a company that inspires you and you want to kind of go to school on them and learn from them and see, historically speaking, what their company was like, uh, when they first started it. There's two things you can do. Number one, um, you can get the investor presentation they made to successfully raise money. And I'll talk about the second thing in a second. So what you can do is you can go to slideshare.net, uh, which is owned by LinkedIn, which is owned by Microsoft. And you can do a search on any company, Airbnb, just to see what their investor presentation looked like. And you can go through their slide deck to see how they raise money. So here's their, their original presentation. The second thing I want to talk about is something called Internet Archive. This is fun. Uh, and it's a not-for-profit. And what you can do is you could search to see what websites look like in the past. And so if, if we type up um, Airbnb, let's see what Airbnb.com looked like in the past when they first got started, or maybe there's a company that really inspires you that, um, that you want to use is, or that you want to create. Um, it should be on here somewhere. Search metadata. Here we go. Good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you want to create a similar product to theirs and you're curious, how do they get started? So Airbnb put their website up here in 2009. So let's go back here and let's check out an early version of their website. Let's pick a random date, February 4th, 2009. And let's see what their website looked like then. So let me click here to learn more about what Airbnb's website looked like then. Now, internet access is slow on this website here. Um, this is a, a dot or, dot .org. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So, so here's what it looked like here. Airbnb breakfast. Forget hotels. This is literally what it, what it looked like, right? And it's not perfect. It takes time to load the antiquated HTML um, uh, code, but here's what it looked like uh, early on. It was just a really simple one pager. Okay. Now let's take a look to see what Airbnb looked like in 2012. Um, and I remember, um, actually, let me go back here to 2011. It, it, it's pretty slow, but anyway, you, you could see what the websites look like at different points in, in time. It's not my internet. It's just, it's slow here. Let me pick another random date. Let's go 2011 here, and then we'll pick a date down here. Let's pick March 2nd, 2011. They were in business for a couple of years then. They probably raised uh, some venture capital money at that point. The use of proceeds was probably to make a better website amongst other things. So you can click here to see what their website looked like on that day. So let me pick a certain time. Oh, wow, look at this. Okay, we'll pick 9.42 and five seconds p.m. So you click here and then you can see what the website looked like and how they started growing their company. It's a great way to do um, research on a sector uh, before you start a company as well. You, know, you, you, you can find out what they did to get customers by changing the look and feel of their website. Historically speaking, you can do this for Microsoft, uh, Sun Microsystems. You can do it for every company. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It takes a second to load. Uh, and you can also do it for my, my company, um, the one I started years ago in the 90s called CICC.com. So here's what Airbnb's website looked like on that day. Okay, so they changed up their website a bit. It takes a little while to load all the graphics in well because this is this is all archived. Um, but anyway, it's, it, it's kind of cool. And it's, it wrote here, Airbnb celebrates 1 million nights <coughs> booked. <coughs> pardon me. And so again, this is what their website looked like, <coughs> pardon me, back in 2011. All right, let me go to the next question now. All right. Um, <clears throat> next question I, I've got here uh, is, is from uh, Fa Fabio. Fabio is saying, uh, hi, Prof. I hope, give me one second. So if you're ever, my, my throat, as you can hear, is going a bit. 
if you're ever giving um, a presentation and, you know, one speech can change your life and your voice goes, there's a product and I never get sponsored by anybody and I never will. I'll never sell it. There's a product called Throat 37 and you spray it and you can talk gooder, better. So give me one second. A lot of uh, a lot of opera singers use it. My my voice will come back. Don't worry. <clears throat> All right. Um, so uh, Fabio is saying hi, Prof. Hope you are well. Uh, it's finally time for my favorite weekly event. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, can you briefly explain what happened during uh, Black Wednesday and what role uh, did George Soros have in it. Well, I know Black Monday. I'm not familiar with 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 Black Wednesday. Uh, maybe that's when George Soros uh, shorted the pound or shorted uh, the tie bot. The he shorted both of them. So I'll talk about how he broke the Bank of England and how he broke uh, the tie bot. He destroyed it as well. And he's not very well liked uh, in Thailand for that reason. So what, what happens with currencies is when a currency is fixed to another currency, like in, in the Caribbean, uh, several Caribbean countries, their currency is fixed or pegged to the US dollar, like the Bayesian dollar that was for years in Barbados. And what that, why, the reason they do that is they want the dollar in Barbados, for example, to stay at the exact same level as the US dollar. And they do that because a lot of their tourists come from the United States. It's just easier for tourists to book and know that FX is not going to fluctuate, the foreign exchange. So what countries do in order to make that a reality is they have to actually have their own currency reserves and buy and sell the other currency that they're fixed to so that it will stay at the exact same level from a supply demand perspective. And if they run out of money, then all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, we can't have our currency fixed to another currency and we have to make it a floating or variable currency, which is what most currencies are. Um, and so what George Soros did uh, to the Bank of England and to the Thai bot is he forced uh, England as well as, uh, as Thailand to no longer have their currencies fixed. And he made a billion dollars in one day by shorting uh, the, 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 the British pound. And the way he did it was, so at that point in time, years ago, it was back in the 90s, uh, the British pound was, uh, was, was pegged to a bunch of other currencies globally. And so what he did was he shorted the British pound to the extent that the uh, Bank of England ran out of reserves. They didn't have any money left to keep that currency fixed. Uh, and so they had to let it float meaning be a variable currency. Uh, and then the currency went down a lot. Uh, and then what happened was George Soros made a billion dollars in, in, you know, in one day. And it wasn't just him. There, there was the, the hedge fund mafia piggybacked on that trade as well, you know, uh, like Tiger, a uh, great hedge fund, et cetera. He also did the same thing in Thailand to the Thai bot. Um, so hopefully that answers the question of, of how he profited uh, immensely uh, from a, a fixed income FX perspective by shorting the pound, uh, as well as the Thai bot. All right, next up, we've got uh, Dario uh, from Italy. Uh, Dario is saying, uh, hi, Chris, hope all is well. Uh, today, I want to ask, what do you think about the IBM spinoff, spin -off, which will probably take place at the end of next year? Yeah, so generally speaking, and my wife works um, in marketing at, at IBM, and obviously, I'm not privy to anything. Um, so... When investors invest in companies, usually they're either growth investors or value investors. So Warren Buffett is a value investor. He loves buying things that are cheap um, and that throw off a lot of cash. A lot of hedge funds are growth investors. They don't like buying things that are cheap. They like buying things that are expensive, that are growing fast, and that one day those companies you know, will be able to cut expenses uh, and, and make a ton of money like Amazon. So you're either a growth investor or a value investor, and you're usually not in the middle. Um, so the problem with, uh, and I'll let me talk about a historical case uh, instead of talking too much about IBM. 
So with eBay, eBay for years, there was two big parts to the company. There was the sleepy, slow growth marketplaces auction business. And value investors love that kind of business because it's counter cyclical. People sell more stuff uh, when it comes to recessions. Then there was also the high growth PayPal division and growth investors loved it. Now, value investors didn't like the PayPal asset and growth investors didn't like the core eBay marketplace auction business asset. And so what happened was Carl Icahn, um, who's a brilliant um, uh, private equity investor, um, he's an activist. He came onto the board of eBay and forced them to break up into two companies, eBay and PayPal. And that unlocked shareholder value big time because the value investors could now buy eBay because they just wanted to invest in the marketplace business, the auction business, and the growth investors could buy PayPal. So that's what IBM is thinking about as well. They basically want to cater to two types of investors. One is a growth investor, one is a value investor, and you're either one or the other, and it's rare for you to be in the middle. Last thing I'll say on this is don't ever invest in a company that is transitioning from growth to value, okay? Because when it transitions from growth to value, and it happens to every company, it's in what I refer to as investment purgatory. It usually takes like a decade for that stock to go from growth to value. And while it's going from growth to value in that decade, nobody buys it. Nobody wants to own it because it's not cheap enough for, um, for value investors yet. And it's not growing fast enough anymore for growth investors. So it's an investment purgatory. Uh, and so investors get confused because you're either a growth investor or a value investor. And it usually takes 10 years. Never buy a stock that's an investment purgatory that's transitioning from growth to value. And the way to make the 10 years shorter is the private equity firms come in and they buy that undervalued asset. They make it grow faster and then they sell it back to the market. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of what, uh, and they can make it, that's the catalyst for making the 10 year transition purgatory wise shorter. And that's what Carl Icahn does all the time. He did that with, with eBay. He bought a stake in the company, muscled his way onto the board, which he's allowed to do if you own a big stake in a company. And he forced the company to restructure. Uh, I think he, he and John Donahoe, who's a great guy, I've met him, met him many times as CEO of, of, of eBay, they kind of parted ways, so to, so to speak. Um, and then uh, Icon made that 10-year transition a couple of years or even less so. Uh, and then lo and behold, shareholder value was unlocked because eBay uh, reemerged as the core eBay asset that value investors loved. It was the marketplace business, auction business, and then PayPal as well. Yeah. All right. Um, next question is, is from Dario. Uh, Dario is saying, where would you suggest keeping Ripple coins uh, since the Tracer one doesn't support them? Uh, and yeah, and then you were, I'm sorry for all my questions. No, don't be sorry, please. You're the customer. Uh, this is customer support. Please ask me as many questions as you want. And this is fun for me. Thank you. I always love your questions. Okay, so the question is, um, where would you uh, suggest keeping your Ripple coins since Tracer one uh, doesn't support them? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I own Ripple. I, I think I own it in my Ledger Nano S. That's what I use. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe check out the, the Ledger Nano. Okay. Um, and next up, and, and the founder of Ripple lives not too far away from me here. Uh, and for those of you not familiar with Ripple, it's a cryptocurrency that is targeted. Uh, the target market is the big banks. Yeah. Next up is Navid. Navid is, asked, is saying, hey, Chris, I uh, hope you're doing well, likewise. Can you please share good tips for drafting effective emails? Absolutely. So less is more. Never, ever, ever for the rest of your life when you write, especially in emails, never have more than three sentences in one paragraph. And I used to have my own column on the side in Inc. Magazine. And my editor taught me that. He said, never have more than three sentences in one paragraph. Other things that I was criticized for and I learned was don't overuse exclamation marks. It's hard for me because I'm such a positive person. I'm enthusiastic, yeah. And if you're ever confused about, oh my gosh, I can't, I have to have four sentences in one paragraph, then use a semicolon to tie two of them together. 
aside from that, uh, less is more. Um, when you're drafting an email or any correspondence, especially people you don't know, um, you, you start with a nice pleasantry. For me, it's I hope all is well. Uh, that's just the way I write. Um, you use the word please and thank you, and you keep it short. If you make it long, they're never going to reply, right? It's kind of like getting a really long email from your mom. I'm so sorry. Mom, I love you so much. Mom, always send me long emails. I love it. And mom, if you're watching, I, I loved all those letters you wrote to me when I was at Camp Onondaga in the fourth grade in the summer, and I cried and I missed you. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, but don't write long, uh, long emails uh, unless it's your mom. Your mom's allowed to, okay? Um, but uh, also, the, the subject line, uh, make sure it's clickbaitish without being misleading. So uh, keep it short, and, and there's got to be uh, kind of an element of surprise. Uh, like, for example, you won't want to miss this opportunity. That's a little bit cheesy, but you know what I'm getting at. Um, and when I was taught about how to create great titles for articles or emails, whatever, by my editor at Inc. Magazine, um, they had me use numbers a lot. You know, five reasons why you can take your career to the next level by reading this. Um, and, and you'll see a lot of sponsored stories on websites like CNN, etc. Uh, and even in Gadget. Um, you know, why Prince Harry and Prince William are not getting along or whatever BS they're, they're writing about these days. And I did it with my book in terms of numbers. 101 crucial lessons they don't teach you uh, in business school. Um, and, and if you want more tips, um, what you can do is go to my YouTube page and just do a, a search on how to write. And I have a 15 minute video uh, that I teach you uh, how to write effective business communications based on the gazillions of mistakes I've made over the years. All right. Um, next up, uh, Fausto is saying, hey, Chris, uh, hope you're great. Likewise. Quick question. When creating an MVP, an MVP, for those you're not familiar with it, stands for minimum viable product. It means releasing a product that's not 100% ready yet, but you got to release it and get it out there fast because as Salvador Dali said, if you strive for perfection, you'll never attain it. So Fausta is saying, when creating an MVP, minimum viable product, should I focus on traction and growth or quickly making a profit? Yeah. So I, I believe that um, one of the purposes of, of an MVP is not to generate profit, but to get your product out to market fast so that you can quickly get customer feedback and you can alter or change your product and or service quickly on the fly. And if you wait until your product is perfect to release it, you'll never get it out or the competition will have already saturated the market and it's too late for you. So... I would focus not on profit, quick profit, ever. I would focus on being very long-term oriented. And you can take my MBA degree program, learn more here, and I'll put you through a venture capital boot camp to teach you how to get your product out there and how to grow uh, your company quickly as well. So I would be very, very long-term focused because as Warren Buffett said, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. And Figure out profitability later. Just get your product out as fast as you can so you can get feedback. Yeah. All right. Uh, ne next up, uh, we've got uh, Naveed who's saying uh, another question. How can we respond to a recruiter in a decent way if we're not uh, interested in an opportunity proposed by the recruiter? but we want to keep a good relationship with them. Yeah. So here's how I've dealt with recruiters. So I really believe that if you help people in life, it'll come back to get to help you. And recruiters have helped me a lot. And here's how I've done it. So, and by the way, if, if you get a call from a recruiter, um, just call them back in your personal line and always take that call in that meeting, please. Because you never know when the company you work at might be restructured or whatever it is. And you got to provide for yourself and your family, most importantly. But what I usually do is this, or I have done. I, I tell the recruiter, you know, thank you so much. Uh, please keep me on your list and keep calling me. I'm very happy uh, where I am right now. But uh, if you want, I can provide you with a list of five people that you can talk to that might be interested in this job. And I can introduce you as well. I've done that many, many times. And it's helped me tremendously, especially with a firm called James Beck here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, they've called me, you know, trying to recruit me for various companies over the years. 
and I've always introduced them to a gazillion other people and it came back and helped me a lot in the long run. Give and you will receive. It's prophetic. It's been true since the beginning of time. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Fabio is, is asking, excuse me, uh, I, I would like to know your thoughts on Paul Tudor Jones. Yeah, so Paul Tudor Jones, uh, for those you're not familiar, uh, is, is a hedge fund uh, billionaire. He started Tudor uh, back in the 80s. And your question is, I'd like to hear, know your thoughts on Paul Tudor Jones and his prediction of the crash of the market in 1987. He tripled his money by holding short positions, making a $100 million profit. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't personally know him, so I can't vouch for him. Um, and I don't personally know anybody that's ever worked for him. I know people that have worked at almost every other large hedge fund, and I have opinions on most funds, uh, but not that one. But what I will tell you uh, about 1987, <clears throat> uh, Black Monday, they called it, there was one day where the market fell a lot. And um, what happened was there was a couple of people that were really young that made a fortune, and because of that one day, they, their hedge funds took off. And so there's examples of this. There's Paul Tudor Jones, and there's another guy named Ken Griffin. Great guy. Um, he used to be my boss's boss when I worked at Citadel years ago. Brilliant man. Uh, and I had friends that went to Harvard with him. And just like whenever I meet somebody more successful than me, which is every meeting in my life, I always ask for what made you successful or them successful. And what Ken Griffin did uh, when he was at Harvard was he had a satellite dish in 1987 outside of his dorm room. And I think he graduated in three years uh, instead of four. And my buddies that went to, that were in the dorm with him at Harvard, they said that they didn't get to know him that well. He was a really good guy. He worked very hard. Uh, but they remember a ton of FedEx has always piled up at his door, investment research reports. And what he did was he got live feeds that way. Uh, and he went short the market in 87 and, and he made a killing a killing. And there was a, a company uh, in Chicago, one of his big investors was there uh, that invested in his firm and he scaled his company big time. And eventually he moved to Chicago and he started Citadel there. Uh, but uh, yeah, so he's done really well. And for those who are not familiar with shorting, it's the opposite of buying a stock. So when you buy a stock, they, re they refer to it as <clears throat> you went long a stock. You're long a stock. You own it. The opposite of going long a stock is shorting a stock which means you borrow the shares at a certain price. You then sell them and hopefully you can buy them back cheaper and you make money between the price, what you sold it at <clears throat> or what you bought it at and what you, you sold at and covered it at. And then you return it to whoever you borrowed it from uh, plus a fee. <clears throat> and I don't rec recommend anybody short stocks unless you work as a professional investor because there's unlimited loss uh, potential if the stock goes up to infinity or whatever it is. If you want to bet against companies, look into buying puts. And a put is basically a financial instrument where you invest this much money. If it goes down, you make a lot. If it goes up, all you lose is this here. And they call it a hedge fund because if you think about a backyard, um, there are hedges around backyard that protects capital. It protects your backyard, so to speak. Yeah. And, and, and don't, please, if you're going to short stocks, uh, don't do it. But, it, but if, if you're doing it, um, keep in mind that never short a stock that's crowded, meaning the short interest ratio, SIR, is over 10 days to cover. And be careful with shorting stocks with high dividends because you have to pay back that dividend. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Michael is saying, hi, Chris, it's, it's Michael from Indonesia, uh, wishing you well uh, and informing you that I apply the content in Udemy and, and, and your content in YouTube as well. Thank you, I, I appreciate that, thank you. And I actually, uh, on my 10th weekly webcast, this is uh, week 110 right now, 110, on my 10th weekly webcast, I met this incredible woman from Indonesia and um, she was one of my students uh, named um, Sasha Stevenson. And she started giving me advice on my YouTube vlogs. And it was really helpful. And I was like, who is this person? And uh, I, I clicked on her, her name in YouTube, her profile, whatever. And she has over 100 million views on her YouTube channel in Indonesia. She's an internet sensation. And so what we did was we made a course called the Complete uh, YouTube Course. And if you're interested, just search my name and, and Udemy and you'll find our course there. 
but I learn a ton from my students. She's great. And Michael is saying, my, my question is, what are your thoughts about Apple not giving the iPhone 12 chargers and earphones? Uh, is it just a plot to make more money? Yeah. I think Apple is ethical compared to other companies. Like, I, I view Apple is the antithesis of Facebook. You know, um, Apple does more to help the world. Facebook, the opposite. It, it is what it is. Um, so, um, I think Apple is ethical. I think they really do believe, um, really at the core fabric, uh, DNA subfabric of, of who they are in making the world a better place and also helping the environment. Like the way that their building was melt, it made their, their close encounters of the third kind spaceship building, um, is very environmentally friendly. Yeah. I think they're doing the right thing. And the reason why I think they made the iPhone boxes from this tall to this tall is to help the environment. I really do. I really do. And also, um, like I, I, I own a, like I own a, a bunch of these Apple monitors uh, as well. Uh, and when I buy them, it's a little ridiculous. Actually, I'll be intellectually honest with you. There's this book. It's a big book with little pictures on each page that shows how to put together this monitor. They didn't really need to do that. That could have been done on one page. So I, I've got to, I got to be intellectually honest there. Uh, with, with that. Uh, but, but, but I think they set a good example for others when it comes to their environmental policy in general. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. And in terms of earphones, like I really don't see many people using Apple earphones anymore. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, and give me one second. This, this happens every now and then YouTube will jump. So I do a, a control F for the word Apple. And we'll see if this comes up here. Hold on a second, guys. Sorry. This, this, this happens rarely, but it does. Apple. Okay, here we go. I found it. Thank you. That was a senior moment. The older I get, the, the, the better I was. All right. Next up is a personal growth uh, question from, from D'Angelo, uh, which is, how do you get out of your own way when it comes to going after new and uncomfortable professional goals and personal goals. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would say whatever your fear is in life, uh, you, you gotta run towards your fear. Why? Because your competition won't. If you're fearful of public speaking like I was for years, I would rather die than give a speech. If you're fearful of public speaking, run towards your fear. You know, do a search on Toastmasters. Uh, and start going to local events or doing them over Zoom, giving speeches. If you're fearful of accounting, like I was, and I got a D in accounting the first time I took it in undergrad because I was memorizing accounting and not understanding it. I had to take it again, and I got a little bit better in a D, but not much. So what, what I did was I, I conditioned myself to understand and enjoy reading financial statements like a good book. How? By understanding why formulas are the way they are. And I teach about this in my MBA degree program with, with a ton of props. I teach about it in different ways. For example, what's the purpose of a balance sheet? Why does it exist? Well, if a balance sheet didn't exist, you wouldn't know what you own. So the income statement tells you yeah, how much money you make. The balance sheet will tell you what you own. Well, how does it work? Well, why is it called a balance sheet? Always question why. Challenge everything like the old Sega commercials. So the reason a balance sheet exists is to tell you what you own and who owns what your stuff. But think of it like a balance scale. Uh, and so on one side of the balance scale is stuff you have in your possession. And stuff you have is either owned by you or somebody else. So stuff you have has to equal who owns that stuff. And so the scale has to balance in the balance sheet. So stuff you have in your possession, they're called assets. Assets basically means stuff I have. So stuff I have has to equal who owns that stuff. Well, stuff I have is either owned by me or somebody else. So let me give you an example. Let's say I own a car, okay, it's, or I have a car in my possession, it's my stuff and it's a hundred bucks. And 
Half of that car is owned by the bank of Toyota. I'm financing it and the other half is me. So my $100 car, the stuff I have my asset, is equal to $50 in debt to the bank of Toyota. That's a liability. Plus 50 bucks in equity that I have in that car. Equity just means ownership. So $100 car equals 50 bucks I owe to the bank of Toyota. And I already own the other 50 bucks. So assets equals liabilities plus equity. And then think about rearranging that equation uh, as well. So equity equals assets minus liabilities, which makes sense. My ownership of something is equal to the amount I own of it, the amount I, I paid, minus the debt I owe others. So you have to condition yourselves to enjoy accounting and finance, right? And it's not intuitive. And I thoroughly enjoy teaching it. Uh, and if you want to learn more, you join my MBA degree program. And I teach uh, all about that as well. Okay. All right. Um, uh, next up is uh, Emily is saying, hey, Chris, uh, hope you're doing well. Likewise, do you think Apple is dying now? Um, do you think they will succeed in transforming into the subscription-based business model? Yeah, that's a great question. So what, what Apple did a couple years ago, um, and, and we're doing a case study of this in my MBA degree program. Um, so what, what Apple did a couple years ago was they created different revenue line items, one of them being subscription. And the reason they did it is because investors absolutely love subscription business models. So for example, uh, if you have a magazine subscription, um, you might not cancel it. You might get lazy like I am sometimes and the magazines just keep coming. You subscribe to it. But if you paid a one-time fee, you might not renew that. So it's kind of like with Netflix. So Netflix is a subscription-based business model. People subscribe, they pay 10 bucks a month or whatever it is in every country. If you had to pay $100 upfront every year for it, you, you probably wouldn't do it. But subscription business models work because people don't cancel as often. There's not as much churn uh, with, with that business model. And investors love it because revenue visibility is amazing. It's incredible. And cloud computing... Basically, all these cloud computing companies use subscription business models like Salesforce.com, ticker CRM, et cetera. Uh, and so Microsoft realized this too, ahead of many other enterprise software companies. They created something called Software Assurance back in 2003, which means people renting, or I should say subscribing to software. And Office 365 is now a subscription-based business model. Investors love it. When you create your business plan uh, and... If you want, you can be part of my venture capital boot camp and my Haroon MBA degree program. But I want you to think about subscription models uh, because what happens is investors love it, uh, customers don't cancel as often, um, and uh, it's just a smart way to start a company. And so Apple has subscription now uh, with their, their video game service, the Arcade, which I think antitrust should not allow because it's not fair that Apple is making other people, is, is, is forcing you to take a look at a free uh, subscription uh, to this product and not buying other video games, for example. And that's why there's been a dearth or a lack of innovation on the Apple store because Apple's monopoly power it is what it is. But Apple has done subscription with that. They've done subscription, of course, with, with Apple Music, which is another antitrust issue because they kind of muscled out Spotify and Pandora by giving people a free trial, etc. It's just not fair. It's not fair. Um, but, um, anyway, I, so, subscription is the future and people are, subs you basically subscribe to their hardware too. It's what you do. It's what I do whenever I get an iPhone because I always want to have the newest, latest, greatest cause I'm a nerd. Okay. Let me move on now. And, and by the way, when I was answering that question, I noticed that the number of people watching this webcast went down a lot. So that always helps me know in real time to move on. Instant feedback. Okay. Uh, Next up uh, question is, I learned programming languages uh, like JS, uh, JavaScript, uh, React, HTML, CSS, etc. How can I develop this skill to make money with it? Yeah. So a couple things. Um, number one, you can teach courses on platforms like Udemy on how to code. Number two, you can go to upwork.com. That's U-P-W-O-R-K. Uh, and sell your services there to do programming work. I've hired a lot of people from Upwork. You can also, if you're just getting started, go to uh, a great Tel Aviv-based company 
called Fiverr. That's F-I-V-E-R-R.com, which is a, a great platform service where you can sell your services as well, starting at five bucks. Uh, you get what you pay for, though. So I would check out those aforementioned resources uh, in order to help um, scale your side hustle. Yeah. All right, next question is, do you think Tesla will be a monopoly in the automobile industry? It seems like no other car manufacturer is going to catch up with them. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, the, the automotive industry is so CapEx intensive, um, it, it'll be tough for them to, to basically corner the market in general. There, there's a lot of competition. Competition's good for the consumer. There's a lot of other great companies uh, like like Mercedes, BMW, et cetera, that are doing great things with, with hybrid cars. Toyota, of course, as well. Um, and what Elon Musk did a couple of years ago was he kind of open sourced part of the battery technology so that everybody else, other companies, can use that uh, technology as well. Yeah. Okay, next question is from Alan who's saying, hey, Chris, I uh, hope you and your family are doing well. Thank you, likewise. Uh, my question is, do you think uh, this is the best time to invest in real estate property? Yeah. So I, I, I can hear my late great grandfather um, saying right now, he used to say to me all the time, Krishy, buy land. They're not making it anymore. So I love to invest in items that are scarce. And that's why most cryptocurrencies or many of them, I think, are an absolute scam because there's no limit on how many cryptos can be created with many cryptocurrencies, not all of them. So I always love uh, real estate, uh, but you gotta be careful with real estate because it's, they're vicious cycles, usually 10 years, uh, feast or famine. And just know that if you invest in real estate, you might not get your money back for at least 10 years. So it, it, when interest rates are very, very low, quite often what happens is real estate prices go up a lot, why? Because it's cheaper for people to get a mortgage to finance a house or an apartment. Uh, and also, people don't want to keep money in the bank if interest rates are low. They want to buy stocks or, or real estate, uh, for example. So I usually buy when everyone's freaking out. You got to buy when there's blood in the streets. Um, I, I know it's an uncomfortable thing to say, uh, but when it feels uncomfortable for you to buy something, that's the time to buy. Why? Because if you buy when everybody else is buying, who's the incremental investor to push that investment class higher? There's not as many. You know, my favorite thing when it comes to stocks, at least, is to buy broken stocks, but not broken companies. You know, and last thing I'll say is, uh, to quote the sage of Omaha, Warren Buffett, you gotta be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. Uh, one more thing. The latest real estate investment I made was I bought a building uh, an hour and a half south of Toronto in London, Ontario, where I was born. And it's uh, right beside the University of Western Ontario. Uh, and I did it because well, I got a great deal. Uh, and the students that are renting, I have a bunch of students renting places there. Um, it more than covers the mortgage. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think the education is counter is, is counter cyclical as well. It's somewhat recession proof. Yeah. All right. Um, next up, uh, Abby is saying, hey, Chris, I uh, hope you, you and your family had a good week. Likewise, I have a couple of questions. Um, my attitude. I, a, a couple of people asked me for help this week, and my attitude has been when one teaches to learn. So thank you. Excellent. I agree. I agree. If you want to learn something, man, you got to teach it. You know, I, I, I taught a course on videography, partially because I want to help, but also I want to learn. If you stop learning, you, I don't know, you stop living. All right, now, but Abby is saying, oh, also, uh, did, you, <laughs> did you go to the bathroom at all during my 12-hour live open house webcast last, last, uh, last Friday? I did after 10 hours. It, it was my record. And yes, there, there were, I read all the comments, whatever people are like, is this guy wearing a catheter or something? I'm not, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I just have uh, amazing st stamina when I'm doing something I absolutely uh, love to do. And thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. All right. Um, now, Luigi is, is saying, hey, Chris, I uh, hope you are doing great. Likewise, I've taken most of your courses on Udemy. I would like to ask, what's the difference between the courses offered in Udemy and your Haroon uh, Ventures uh, MBA degree program, I think is what, what you're referring to, yeah. And you can learn more about uh, the Haroon MBA degree program there. So 
I teach concepts in a different way and in much, 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 much more detail as well. So the MBA degree program, uh, if you're in the gold or platinum version, you can go to this website to learn more. Um, it's, it's over 300 hours of classes plus more than 200 hours of live Q&A like this or using Zoom. And in the platinum version, you also get a couple hours of one-on-one -on -one time with me uh, for confidential consultation. I'll even write your entire LinkedIn profile if you want me to during those consultations. So I go into a lot more detail. Do I teach or accounting and finance? Yes. Did I teach them in Udemy as well? Yes. I teach it in a different way though, using props. And I build upon everything as well. You don't have to have any prerequisites to take my MBA degree program. If you take in my Udemy courses, uh, when you uh, pay uh, for the MBA degree program, for every course you've taken on Udemy, um, you get a $10 discount. So mention that uh, in the email when you when you register as well, yeah. And Udemy is a great partner of mine. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, next up, uh, Luigi is saying, um, or actually, uh, um, uh, Mr. Lee is saying, have you heard about Palantir? Uh, if yes, any thoughts on this data analytics company? Thanks, Chris. I have. In fact, I invested in them when it was a private company when I worked in venture capital. Um, and then I sold my position um, when it was a private company. So, um, and, I, and I did it because I, I cashed out of almost all my venture capital investments. So Palantir, for those of you not familiar, um, it's a software company. And it's an, a software company based here in Shallow Al Palo Alto. Um, and the Obama administration, without Palantir, would not have found Osama bin Laden. That's right. So Palantir is a software product that will predict future events, or at least look at a lot of data and be able to find patterns. Uh, and governments use it for security reasons, especially the CIA, that's publicly disclosed. CIA was actually the first uh, investor in Palantir. And the CIA does actually very good venture capital investments. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of technology we use today was actually invested in by governments for military reasons, like uh, GPS. Um, that was from guided missiles. Uh, Oracle, the database company, uh, Oracle's first customer uh, was the CIA, which and they did a top secret database project called uh, Project Oracle. Um, and so Palantir is not just for government. Um, it's also for many other sectors. So many of the big financial services companies in the world, they use Palantir software um, called Gotham, I think one of them. You know where they got that from. And what the, what the software does is it helps big banks and financial services to undercover potential potential vulnerabilities from a security perspective uh, in their network, so to, so to speak. Governments also use Palantir uh, to help find uh, human trafficking uh, uh, operations, um, et, et cetera. So it's it's a it's a data uh, analytics company. Um, now, in order to be intellectually honest, I'm not an investor in the company, and I don't have any information on the company at all. Uh, but one thing I will say, one of the critiques uh, is um, from, a, a, there was a cover, here we go. I'll refer to a Forbes cover story from 2013 or so on it. Um, there was one point where the customers of Palantir, not Palantir itself, it was the police department, I think in Oakland. They took pictures of tons of license plates all over the place and they fed it into a Palantir, the Palantir software product. Uh, and that was kind of a violation of privacy. It wasn't Palantir's fault. It was the customer at that point in time. That's publicly disclosed. Another negative thing I've heard about Palantir um, is, and I'm just trying to be intellectually honest as always with you, is that when you use the product as a customer, it's very people intensive. You have to have people continuing to feed data into the Palantir machine before it can find patterns, etc. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 I love the company, which is why I invested in it when I worked in venture capital. I'm no longer an investor in the company right now. If you're going to invest in that company or any company uh, that goes public or is going public, always read the S1 document first. You can go to sec.gov and read the S1, which is basically a big document uh, created by investment bankers and lawyers to tell you what all the risks are. 
Never invest in a stock or any investment class without reading the offering memorandum first. All right. Next question uh, is from Ud Udhaya, who's saying, hey, Chris, amen. Is it possible to calculate the fair value of, of an ETF? Yeah, yeah. We well, can go to the net asset value uh, of the components um, of, of an ETF. And the best way to do it actually is go and read uh, the prospectus or offering memorandum on the ETF. And they'll provide you with a lot of granularity on what the components are, what how many shares they own, that sort of thing. Now, ETFs, which stands for exchange traded funds, uh, they're much better investments than, than mutual funds. They're much better investments uh, because the fees are lower and 90% of them, or almost all of them, outperform mutual funds anyway. But ETFs, um, which sometimes represent indexes like the S&P 500 index, sometimes they rebalance. So when a new stock gets added, they have to buy more shares in that new stock. And when a stock is removed from an index, that ETF has to sell those shares. Uh, and so ETF companies file many uh, financial reports every year, uh, and they talk about rebalancing in those. Always read the offering memorandum before investing in any asset class, including ETFs. All right, uh, next up, uh, we have Aran, who's saying, uh, what do you think of attention drugs uh, like uh, modafinil? Uh, modafinil, yeah, I'm not a, 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 a healthcare person, I'm sorry. Uh, but I, I biohack a lot. Um, and so everything I consume is, it serves two purposes for me. Number one is antioxidant. Uh, and then number two, uh, it's to keep me alert, healthy, happy, so I can live forever and hopefully teach for 8 million years. Um, so um, this is an antioxidant drink I make uh, every day. It's purplish because of acai, which is a great South American fruit that gives me energy. So I don't use drugs to try to get uh, better attention. I use natural stuff. Now, one other thing I do, I, I biohack a lot. I, I take just a ton of vitamins and herbs, a ton of them, okay? And, and for those of you who have taken my courses or my MBA degree program, and I go into more detail in my program, I, I kind of document what, what some of them are. These are a couple here. This is uh, resveratrol. And I got this from the, um, the VP of engineering, the head of engineering at, at Google, a guy named Ray Kurzweil, who talks about life extension. Uh, and so it's kind of tough to see maybe over here in a white background. Yeah. So resveratrol is, is something that uh, Ray Kurzweil sells. Um, and he has these anti-aging multi-packs. You can't reverse aging, but you can slow it down. So resveratrol uh, is found in red wine. I don't drink anymore, but I don't drink any less. No, I'm just kidding. I don't drink. Uh, resveratrol is found in, in red wine. Now I've got that UB40 song in my head. Um, uh, and, and it actually helps slow down aging, but I, I take a supplement for it. I take omega oil. I take a lot of stuff as well. And, and I biohack a lot, as you know. Now, the best way for me to increase my energy, and please talk to a doctor first before doing what I'm about to tell you, and never take health advice from me, please. Um, but what I do is I do something that gives me insane energy and cognitive abilities, humbly, Something very similar to the movie Limitless with Bradley Cooper, where he took a drug. Drugs are bad. What I do, though, is I drink what's called bulletproof coffee. And by the way, a lot of the herbs I take, and they're not all vitamins, a lot of them are herbs. I'm sure there's a, a placebo effect with some of them. There has to be. Um, but what bulletproof coffee is, is it's a way to consume coffee in a way that's a little bit more less process, I should say. So let me first of all talk about, before I go into Bulletproof Coffee, about butter. And this is out there, but it works for me. Do what works for you. So for hundreds of years, people have been putting butter in their coffee or tea. And when you do it, just a little bit, it tastes good. It's like you put cream or milk in it. And people have been doing it for hundreds of years and consuming that first thing in the morning, which gives them unbelievable cognitive abilities. Um, it works for me, do what works for you. So what I do is every morning, the first thing I consume, along with my shake, is I consume Bulletproof coffee. This is not an advertisement for them. Do your research. Bulletproof coffee is coffee that's made in such a way so that uh, the beans don't have preservatives in it. Because with a lot of coffee, you drink it, you get that quick pick-me-up, 
and then you crash hard because there's mold in the coffee or preservatives. So this, this stuff is pretty good, it's pure. Then I put in that uh, tablespoon of organic grass-fed butter, and I put one more thing in as well. Uh, I, I put in, uh, and, and I keep my coffee, the, the reason I have this mug, and, and this mug, by the way, it's not that great battery-wise, uh, but I, I keep everything at like 140 degrees, and I keep it at that level because when I'm teaching, I don't want my voice to be gone, so I'll, anyway. And also, if you get a, a, a cup warmer like this, you'll drink less coffee. Why? Because I found that for me personally, when I would drink coffee and it was lukewarm, I'd kind of finish it off and go get another cup. This is all I get all day. This is it. And so the last thing I put in is something called MCT oil. And it's kind of like coconut oil as well. And I've been doing what I'm telling you now for more than five years now. And I've never been more creative in my life, partially because I love what I'm doing what I'm doing too, right? Um, so the MCT oil also gives you a lot of energy. Be careful, please. Talk to a doctor first. And I have to warn you that MCT oil, if you put too much in initially, you'll get awful stomach ache. You will. It happened to me. So you got to put a tiny bit in and then a tiny bit more every day until you build up kind of a tolerance for it. Again, talk to your doctor first about this. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, and then uh, Pushpendra is saying, uh, this is so helpful. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and Antonis is saying, hey, Chris, hey, football as well. And then Tian is saying, hi, Chris, I'm grateful for everything uh, you're teaching, your vlog uh, and your MBA course that I will en enroll shortly in. Uh, I bought all your courses already. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I appreciate that. God bless you. By the way, um, when you uh, when you buy the MBA degree program, um, make sure and send, send an email if you want to admissions at haroonventures.com. Mention the courses you've taken on, on Udemy and we'll give you 10 bucks off uh, for every course you've taken. It's our policy. Thank you. Uh, next up, Antonis is saying, what advice do you have for a biology student that does not have any experience and wants to start uh, from somewhere to eventually work for a hedge fund one day? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So a lot of people that work, uh, um, that, that have medical degrees or have studied science end up in hedge funds. Um, if they're aggressive enough networking. I'll give you an example. There, there's a guy, a great guy I used to work with uh, named uh, David Farhadi. Uh, and David is a brilliant man. Uh, he went to, um, to medical school. He's a doctor. And we worked together on the same team at Pequot, big hedge fund, years ago. Um, and what was great about him was not only was he wicked smart uh, and understood science uh, and, and medicine, but he was also very good at networking. So um, what, what I challenge you to do, and I say it with love in my heart, is to network aggressively. And you can go to my website, haruneducation.com, and download my networking book for free. And it'll teach you how to get a meeting with almost anybody and, and how to network. Because your network is your net worth. Uh, and so what I would probably do is, is this. Uh, I don't know um, uh, where you're from, what school you went to, that sort of thing. But what I would do is I would do an advanced search on LinkedIn. And I would find people that went to your school that work in finance or work at hedge funds or find people from the same hometown as you uh, on LinkedIn doing advanced search that work at hedge funds and then set up informational meetings with them. I tell you in my book exactly how to get all these meetings uh, because relationships are more important than product knowledge and your network is your net worth. And I promise you if you do that over and over and over again, rinse, lather, repeat, you will be successful. It's like dating. You have to ask many times, but you have to have no shame and not care what people think of you because as Dr. Seuss said, those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. All right. Next up uh, uh, question is uh, from Tian who's saying, my question is, do you believe that geothermal will be our next energy uh, revolution? Uh, I'm so sorry. I don't know anything about geothermal. If I was in an interview right now, uh, what I would say is this. I, I would say, um, I don't know much about that topic, but I'll find out and get back to you. And then I'd write it down. And then later on that evening, when you send your, send your thank you email, thank you for the meeting, um, you mention, I did some research on geothermal, for example, and here are my humble thoughts. And when I was at Goldman Sachs in the training program, 
they, they taught us, if you don't know the answer to something, you've got to be resourceful. So you always say, I don't know, but I'll find out. Next up, Casey is saying, can you please give us some examples of businesses that your students have started while studying uh, the MBA program? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, so there's, um, there's a guy named uh, uh, Raphael. Great guy. Uh, he's from Brooklyn, but he lives in Florida. Uh, and he started uh, a, a company called uh, Doc Formative. Uh, which is awesome. And I think he might have started it right before he started uh, the MBA degree program, but, but I've helped him a, a bit with it. Actually, not too much. He's brilliant. He did all the work himself. But let me see if I can find it. There's actually a great app for it as, as well. Um, and he actually got a lot of meetings by networking, uh, uh, using the stuff we, we learned, uh, we, I taught in the MBA degree program. So Doc Formative. Hold, uh, Doc, oh, here it is here. Doc, Doc Formative. Yeah, here it is here. Uh, and, and he's actually done really, really well with this. Um, and so it's, it's this unbelievable platform and get the app on your iPhone. If you want to check it out as well, it, it's wicked cool. It's amazing. Um, but it basically it's a platform for helping doctors and pharmaceutical companies get access online to drug products. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, he's got, uh, and I'm not going to disclose his customers yet because I don't think he's disclosed it yet. Uh, but he, he's had uh, advanced talks with some of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world by leveraging networking skills that we talked about in the MBA degree program. Um, and, and he's created a platform which is brilliant too because the best investments in history are platforms. If you own the road, you can charge the cars like the toll booths, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so he's created an amazing platform here. Check out his app uh, if you want to. So that's one of them. Uh, and, and here he is here. Here's, here's Rafa. I smile. He's a great guy. Um, uh, that, that's, that's one of them. Another business uh, that, that my students have started, let me, let me think out loud here and think, think, of, uh, uh, think of them. There's uh, one of my, oh yeah, one of my students named uh, Julian. Um, he's from Sofia, Bulgaria, uh, but he lives in Germany. And he and his son Martin started an awesome clothing company that makes really badass edgy hoodies uh, called Grizzy. Um, and when he releases the product, which I think is coming in November next month, if you're watching the replay, and right now it's October 2020, when he releases the product, I'm going to wear it on the webcast, of course, just to, to support him. He's awesome. Great guy. Great guy. Uh, now, I've had a bunch of other students that have started drop shipping businesses as well, including one of my great students uh, named Stella Lo, uh, who's based in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, let me think of other ones as well. And these are the, the platinum students because I've got to know them well. And if you're curious and you want more details on, on the program, uh, go to this, this website here. Um, I, I also have a, another student in Melbourne, Melbourne named Bernard uh, who started um, um, a, a company that makes a software product that helps you. It's called Task Spur. Helps you to actually um, manage your time better. And it's got an artificial intelligence-based uh, algorithm uh, with uh, a person's voice named Ari. And it's really cool. Let me see if I can find it here. It's called Task Spur. Uh, Bernard Scram smiling. He's just, he's, a, he's a awesome. He's a gentleman. So Task Spur, I think is what it's called. Let's see if he's got the website up here. Yeah, here it is here. Yeah. So he started a company called uh, Task Spur uh, right, right here. Uh, and you can try out the app if, if, if you want to. Again, he's got this guy named Ari right here, A-R-I, I don't know if you can see that, who's uh, your intelligent assistant. It, it's really, really cool uh, what, what he's done. Uh, the dashboarding is off the charts. As well. I, I, I love the product. Try it out if you want to. Download it here on Google or on, or on the App Store. Yeah, so those are just uh, a handful. I can't disclose publicly what some of the other ones are but I will generically discuss what one of my students is doing. One of my students in a certain country is trying to bring a massive professional sports team to his country. That country doesn't have a team in that massive market, which you, you all know about, but he's working on that. I'm helping him out as well tremendously. He's in my platinum program. You can learn more uh, by going to this, this website here. Let me think, what else do I have? Uh, other students, let me, let me think of other ones that, that come to mind. Um, oh, yeah, I, I have a great student uh, in India named Akhil, and he's working on making uh, a healthcare platform uh, that embraces blockchain as well in India. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, so those are just some examples. If you want more, please let me know. Thank you. Oh, and, and by the way, you, you can learn more about my students if you want to reach out to them directly uh, by just going to, um, let me see here, go to my website uh, and then go to online degree uh, MBA and then student testimonials. And you can read through testimonials from all my students, click to go to their LinkedIn profiles, contact them or anybody else. There's over hundred people that are alumni from my program already. Uh, and what you do is just go to LinkedIn, find them and ask them questions if you want to. And, and ask them the negatives as, as well uh, as the positives. Here's Stella. Now Vital, who's, uh, he lives in Germany, but he's, he's from a, a town called Magu, Rwanda. What we're doing together is we're making the French version uh, of my uh, of my entire MBA one course, uh, and that's a side hustle we're doing together. Uh, I shipped him a bunch of equipment for my studio, um, and we're going to make it together. And and the the use of proceeds are, are going to be to from the course on Udemy are going to be to to build that school in in Rwanda. And of course, I've already sent over a ton of money to to, to get uh, to to start building it as well. Let's see what what else do I have? Um, let's see, Eric wrote an amazing book here. Uh, and he just got a, an amazing job with an incredible company. And I'm not allowed to publicly disclose it um, for certain reasons. Yeah, but it's amazing. Now, maybe one day he'll put it on his LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Um, let's see who, who else I have. These are just, yeah. Uh, Lamarck is starting an online education company as well. He's great. Uh, he's uh, from the Philippines. He's currently in Sacramento. Uh, he was visiting his outlaws, in-laws. Uh, <laughs> actually, when you have kids, the outlaws become in-laws. Just kidding. I can get myself in trouble here. But he's flying back to the Philippines uh, to Manila soon. He's been stuck here for COVID reasons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Rose started a, a, a really cool um, uh, online music video based service, which is groundbreaking. It's really, really cool. Really cool. So there, there's that. Uh, Kevin has started many companies as, as well. Uh, Aram already runs his own digital consulting firm uh, in Belgium. Great guy, uh, et cetera. Uh, Apurva is investing in real estate, I think, now. Um, I, I, these are just some of them off the top of my head. Yeah. So, uh, and feel free to contact anybody you, you want that's taken the program, especially where you don't see testimonials. Just search for them on, on LinkedIn and just reach out to them and just ask. Yeah. And I have a 30 day, 100% money back guarantee with the MBA degree program. Uh, and all, with all my courses as well. And the way it works actually, so we start December 14th. So if you register and pay today, um, you get your money back all the way up until 30 days after the program starts, meaning you get your money back uh, all the way through January 14th, 2021. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Charlotte is saying, uh, hello, Chris. Um, uh, lovely to be on your live group here. Uh, and everything uh, you've just shared here has helped me so much. Thank you, Charlotte. I appreciate that. God bless you. Um, next up is Kundan, who's saying, uh, hey, Chris, what are your thoughts on decentralized social media platforms, search engines, et cetera? Is blockchain the next uh, industrial revolution? Also, uh, is it a good time to learn blockchain development? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, when it comes to decentralized social media platforms, I, I'd love for you to, to give me an example, please, because they're all kind of decentralized. There's no main uh, central repository online. They have hot sites and backups, and they use caching software from companies like uh, Akamai, et cetera. So they are decentralized, um, so to speak, if you look at their, their infrastructure. But if you want, you can name individual companies. I'd be more than happy to give you my humble thoughts. Uh, in terms of search engines, uh, there's Google and then there's everybody else. You know, kind of like in education tech, there's Udemy and everybody else is Bing, so so to speak. But I do think that antitrust is going to break up Google very, very soon um, into several companies because the second biggest search engine in the world is YouTube. Uh, and I think uh, Google has too much monopoly power. So I think they're going to be broken up. And I think Google knows that, which is why they rebranded themselves as Alphabet years ago. They have a plan. In terms of is it um, a good is good time to learn a blockchain development? Only if you're passionate about programming, do what you love doing, and you'll be very successful. There's a brilliant man named Kirill 
who teaches you how to make a blockchain uh, on, on Udemy. Uh, so take his course to learn how to do that. You can also take my course to learn about cryptocurrencies if you're interested. Yeah. In terms of is blockchain uh, the next industrial revolution? I, I, I think it. I think it's a, it's a big deal. I do. And what people don't realize, let me explain blockchain. So blockchain is kind of the, the core infrastructure for cryptocurrencies. Um, and so whenever you mine a Bitcoin, for example, um, what happens is you get a reward for doing that, uh, but that transaction is added to this digital ledger called block, blockchain. Uh, and so that's with Bitcoin. With other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, so there's something called Ethereum, the ticker is ETH, and what runs on the Ethereum platform, the cryptocurrency is called Ether, ETH. With Ethereum, it's not just about a blockchain to securely store transactions for the Ether uh, cryptocurrency. It's so much more. It's about sharing information, kind of like DocuSign, but globally and more securely. So you have legal contracts can be in that blockchain, so to speak. You have election records as, as well. Uh, you have contracts uh, when it comes to buying houses or any kind of legal contract you want, which is why I use the DocuSign analogy. All right, next up, we've got Loving Literacy, uh, who is Melody Johnson, uh, and she's a wonderful teacher from uh, Atlanta. And, and on our call last week, um, she actually... I gave away a couple prizes and she won a prize for the gold version of, of my MBA degree product. So congratulations, um, uh, Melody. I'm looking forward to working with you. And she also has an amazing course on Udemy that I took and I wrote a review for. Everybody check it out. Do a search on Udemy on Melody Johnson. She's a brilliant teacher. She's great. So uh, Melody is saying, hello, Chris. Uh, I hope you are well today, likewise. I'm working away at my course. Awesome. And, and Melody is making another course coming out soon on, on LinkedIn. Or pardon me, on, on, on Udemy. Yeah. I don't teach, by the way, on, on LinkedIn. I know a lot of teachers do. I don't because um, in 2016, they approached me. Uh, we had a really good conversation. And the way that LinkedIn works, by the way, when you teach, they, they, they bought a company called Linda. The way they work on the Linda platform is you script it, then they fly you down to Santa Barbara and you record in their studio. It looks very professional. Then it takes them six weeks to edit all that stuff. Uh, and it's great, high quality. However, the reason I won't do it, and I'll never do it, is because in the contract, and I'm not releasing anything to you that's proprietary, but they stipulate that you're not allowed to teach anything remotely similar to that on any other platform or anywhere else. Uh, and I don't want to be exclusive to just LinkedIn. So that's why I do not teach on LinkedIn and I never will. Okay, uh, so um, you wrote here, uh, I'm working away at my course. I'm listening to your webcast today. Thank you. What type of broadcasting system do you use? I'm practicing OBS. Yeah, so in my MBA degree program, um, I, I teach you how to use many software products from scratch as well, in including Photoshop, Premiere Pro, uh, Final Cut, uh, as well as uh, OBS. Now, OBS, for those of you not familiar, it stands for Open Broadcasting Software. And it's a free software product, it's open source, that you can download so that you can do broadcasts like I'm doing now. So I teach you how to do that from scratch in the MBA degree program in one of the sales, marketing, and communication classes. I also teach you how to use Twitch. I teach you also how to use uh, Streamlabs OBS. And I teach you how to use the product I use. Now this product I, I do pay for, it, it's called Wirecast. So this is Wirecast here. Uh, and what I do is I map certain pedals so that when, when I press certain pedals, um, I mapped it so that I change cameras to the left, center, right, right one more, and then picture in picture as follows. So if I click here, and it, it's set up like a, it looks like a real broadcasting studio, right? So basically, uh, this is what's going to go live, and this is live here. Uh, and so I can click here to go live uh, with this shot here. Or what I can do is I can use pedals to cycle through all of these here. So I'm going to go through one, two, three, four, five pedals, and I have the five pedals in order, so I know. So I start here, um, and, and it's just like keyboards, uh, USB keyboards. I map certain keys. Next pedal, next pedal, next pedal, and this here is the the picture-in-picture -picture one here. Yeah. Um, so so that, that that's what I do. 
Um, and it's, you can also play videos here as well and show up, show different splash screens. I have a ton of videos down here on different levels that, that are hidden. So if I wanted to play any sort of video commercial or whatever it is, I, I, I can do so. You know, so if, if I wanted to actually um, show uh, one of my courses here, my, my presentation course trailer, I click here uh, and then you, you, you'd watch it. But I, I don't want to do that. OK. And if you're curious about how I change this here behind me. Um, so this is a matte monitor, M-A-T-T-E, -T -E, meaning that from every angle it works. Um, it, you could see it right. So if I, I switch over to this, this angle here, which is not that great of an angle. You, you can see, let me change that. Yeah, like that. Yeah. So it works uh, there. It, it also works over on, on, on this angle here as well. It's not reflective. Um, and then the way that I, I change it is I have pedals as well. Not, I have seven pedals. I'm a nerd, I know. Uh, but I, these are my dashboards for teaching. And I click it. And this here is ju it's just PowerPoint right here. And I'm just cycling through uh, different different slides with inspirational quotes like my favorite one here uh, from Mark Twain. Okay, next up, um, uh, I've got a question from Tien, which is, hey, Chris, what do you think about uh, the maglev train? Uh, will that change people's perception about future uh, transportation? I don't know enough about it, I'm sorry. Um, but, but I do know that um, Elon Musk, a, a couple of years ago, was talking about um, the Hyperloop, uh, which is an underground ch train, which is supposed to be wicked fast. Um, but I, I don't know much about that. I'm so sorry. Yeah. All right. All right. Next up, Kunan. And by the way, um, so Google, I have a buddy that works at, at Google uh, in the San Francisco office uh, right by Market Street. Uh, now, Google's headquarters are, are in Mountain View, but everybody secretly wants to work in the city. Just like Apple. Apple has that great building in Cupertino. But no one wants to be there. They want to work in the city because there's, there's more people there. It's more fun, right? A lot of single people want to meet people. You meet people in cities. But what Google did uh, was a, a number of years ago, my buddy told me, they tried to buy the underground rights um, from downtown San Francisco, from what's called the Embarcadero Center down there, that, that area, right, the ferry building. They tried to buy the underground rights from downtown San Francisco all the way down to 45 minutes south to Mountain View. So they could quickly get their uh, people that live in the city to Google's main headquarters. Uh, and they were willing to pay $3 billion for it. And the city of San Francisco said no, uh, because it's not fair to favor one company over others. And there's been a lot of issues of people a couple of years ago, back in 2016 or whatever it was, people throwing rocks at Google buses, busing people that, to work and stuff because of gentrification. Um, you know, a lot of real estate prices are astronomically high here in the Bay Area. So that's probably another reason why the city of San Francisco said no. All right, uh, next up, uh, Kundan is saying, uh, should we keep buying stocks at, uh, in, at the same company? If the price falls down slightly, should I buy more or should we sell at a high price and wait for the market to fall again? Yeah. So I'm very, very long-term focused. I don't believe in buying stocks just to make a five or 10% return in one year. I usually buy five by fives, meaning stocks I think can be five baggers within five years. And you'll never be able to time the market perfectly or enter and exit stocks at the perfect prices, but you just have to be directionally correct. You know, nobody can call a stock within 10% of the target price. Um, but I teach you in, in my MBA degree program uh, in, in a lot of detail how to manage your portfolio, how to pick stocks, how to value companies, and so much more. So I'm so long-term focused uh, that like Warren Buffett, when I buy stocks, and Warren Buffett says this, he says when he buys stocks, I assume the stock market's going to be closed for 10 years. Now, obviously, the market will never be closed uh, for, for, for 10 years, but that's how long-term focused you have to be because, as Warren Buffett said, uh, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. And we analyze Warren Buffett's portfolio in my MBA degree program and growth investors' portfolios uh, as well. And I teach you advanced portfolio management as well. Uh, and I don't recommend ever having more than 5% of your liquid non-housing uh, net worth. I reckon, recommend never having more than 5% of that in, in, in any one particular stock. 
uh, and I teach you portfolio diversification in stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, etc. Uh, in my MBA degree program. Yeah. And and I like governments around the world. They encourage you to be long term focused to the extent that capital gains taxes, meaning money you 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 pay on 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 profits, is a lot lower if you own something for more than a year. You pay less in tax. And so that's another reason why I think that mutual funds are a horrific scam uh, because mutual fund managers, many of them buy and sell, buy and sell all year long. Uh, and you pay more taxes on that as well versus ETFs or exchange traded funds, which usually just buy once and just sit on the, the stocks forever unless they have to change uh, what's in the index or what's called rebalancing. Yeah. All right. Um, Next, next up is Casey, who's saying, with all the good you do, oh, thank you, uh, with sharing your knowledge and experiences and giving away courses, do you encourage students to give back, meaning with time, skills, or money to others uh, in any way they, they can? Yeah, um, I do. I do. In fact, at the very beginning of, of my MBA degree program, uh, what, what I do is uh, there, there's something called personal growth, uh, a personal growth track. And I teach people how to network by giving back so that every battle is won before it's been fought, meaning before they go to every single meeting, they know exactly how to give back and add value to that person's life. And you got to do it by thinking with your heart first, and then this will work better. Ask and you will receive as well. It's prophetic, it's been true since beginning of time. Now, in terms of giving, uh, there's a great book you should read called Give and Take. And in that book, I'll summarize it for you. Maybe you don't have to read it. Just take my summary here. The bottom line is, is this, the poorest 1% of people in the world, people with beautiful souls, like, like Mother Teresa, they're givers, they give. The middle 98% of people in the world are takers. They just take, take, take. Most people are takers. The top 1% of people in the world by net worth are givers. And the reason why, one of the reasons they become so successful, many of them, not all of them, is because they gave a lot. Um, not, not just money, but, but mainly their time. They help mentor other people. And when you mentor other people and help other people, you're basically mentoring yourself because when one teaches to learn, it's kind of like when, when you were younger in school and, and a friend of yours asked you for help on a math test, which happened to me maybe once. Somebody asked me for help. When you help them to study for that math test, you did better on the math test yourself because when one teaches to learn. But I really do believe in the, in the process of karma, call it karma, synchronicity, call it what you will. Um, just help other people, give and you'll receive. It's prophetic, it's been true since the beginning of time. Yeah, but, but I, teach, I teach my students in my MBA degree program how to do all of that uh, on steroids, so to speak, and how to take their networking game to the next level. Incremental stuff that I don't have in this book as well. And by the way, if you want the basics of networking, this is a 200-page book you can download for free at my website, uh, haroonventures.com. Yeah. All right. All right. Next up. Uh, so, hey, Solly, how are you? Uh, Solly is one of my wonderful students. He's from Iran originally, but he lives in Lithuania. He's a brilliant programmer, uh, and I always enjoy talking to him, Solly. Hope all is well, buddy. And I'm looking forward to, I think we have a one-on-one -on -one this afternoon, right? Let me, let me check. We have, uh, and for those of you curious about why I have that, that clock up here behind my head, it's because uh, we have 20 minute one-on-ones today. And Solly, you're at 2.10 PM today until 2.30 uh, my time. So I'm looking forward to, 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 to speaking with you then, buddy. Yeah. All right. Um, next up, uh, Kundan uh, is, is asking, uh, Chris, I, I want to do freelance blockchain development before the blockchain trend becomes fully mainstream. How should I approach it? Um, like, how can I find clients and where should I start? Any tips? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, the, the first thing I would do is I would go to upwork.com and I would create a profile of yourself there uh, and discuss your experience with blockchain as well. And then what you can do is you can get customers that way. Another thing I would do 
if you want, is you can go to fiverr.com. That's F-I-V-E-R-R, five with two R's, dot com. Um, now, that's a, a lower end service compared to Upwork, but there might be a little bit of blockchain development work there. What you can also do is write a book. Uh, and hear me out on this, but what, what you can do is you can go to uh, my website, haroonventures.com, download, uh, my, um, um, actually, don't go to that web address. Let me, let me show you another, another one here. Senior moment here, man. The older I get, the better I was. But if you go to my website, haroonventures.com slash all lowercase one word, write book, you can download, and I don't ask for emails or anything, you can download here uh, a, a book or a template on how to write a book in six by nine inch format. There's one page of instructions. It's free. It tells you how to get it up and running on Kindle, Amazon Print, and Audible. And the reason I say to write a book is because the best way to scale a business for free is to write a book and then do a social media campaign based on it and gut your book. That's what I did. That's how I got started. So I wrote this book here. And then what I did was I took one chapter every week, I copied and pasted from it, and I put it on LinkedIn and other social media platforms. Then what I did was I made vlogs out of each chapter uh, as well, and I repurposed that content, um, you know, kind of like nin Nintendo does with all their video games from older platforms. They put them on, on newer platforms. And then what happens is if, if you do that enough times, you become... Um, um, a subject matter expert, a thought leader. The way you become a thought leader is to think like a thought leader, like the Rodin sculpture. I think, therefore, I am. Uh, and so help other people with vlogs, with your book. Give your book away to people. Uh, if you have a book published on blockchain, for example, people will start to think of you as a thought leader. The way you become a thought leader is you think like a thought leader, then it becomes self-fulfilling. Uh, and then just do a blanket blitz campaign on many social media platforms cost you nothing because YouTube is the only gold rush in history that costs you nothing to make the product. And YouTube is also the only gold rush in history where you can get immediate access to a gazillion customers theoretically for free. So that's what I would do. Yeah. And in my MBA degree program, I teach how to network on steroids and get meetings with people that work in the media as well. Uh, and, and one of my students uh, who has an amazing business plan and business model, he just got a meeting with somebody that works at a very large company, United States media company. And that media company wrote an article about him as well. It's free PR. All right. All right. Next up, uh, uh, Melody is saying, I looked at the webcast to see how long it was last Friday's webcast. That was, it was 13 hours, but YouTube only records the first 12 hours. Uh, and then uh, it, it's so funny because when I did that call um, on, on uh, last Friday, if you're watching the replay right now, it's October of 2020. But when I did that call, I had a lot of students <laughs> that watched the first couple hours, then they went to bed um, all over the world. And then they woke up and they left the browser window open. They're like, oh my God, he's still teaching. I just, I love doing what I'm doing. And the good thing is uh, in my MBA degree program, uh, what, what I do is I teach uh, in several different uh, time zones. Um, and uh, you can get more details at this website here. And if you can't watch the time zones uh, live, whatever, then you can watch replays as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, yeah, uh, Melody wrote, uh, I looked at the webcast to see how long I was floored when I saw how long uh, you were sitting uh, in the Zoom call. I was wiped out uh, from waking up so early. Uh, and then you wrote, LOL. Uh, I, I wanted to hang in there. Thanks. And Melody, I, I love you because you're uh, you were you came on to the call with your kids. I think it was back uh, October 31st. October 31st, 2019, we did nine and a half hours straight and you came on with your kids right before you went trick-or-treating. Unfortunately, trick-or-treating is canceled where I live because of, of COVID. Um, but no, it, it, was, it was crazy. And let, let me show you, let me show you Melody. Uh, she's awesome. Um, and, and I'll show you how, the, the call as well and how we structure it. And this will give you a good idea 
uh, in terms of how we do um, uh, the, uh, the Q&A for my, my, my gold and platinum students. So this is the call here. Um, let me go over to here. So we did, it's kind of like a Brady Bunch style here. It, yeah. 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 Kemi had her daughter on. Adorable. Yeah. But let, let me show you here the, the, the style here. And we have this guy named Jay, uh, who's brilliant. He, he's coming on as well. This is me taking a break right here. Uh, but we had, and you, I find that quite often my students, my students so Chris, learn. I really want to tell you, I need to acknowledge you because. Uh, a lot of my, my students, let me turn, turn the volume down there. Uh, a lot of times my, my students learn more from each other than they, they do from, from, from me. Um, they're, they're awesome. They're awesome. Uh, this is Christina. She's great. She lives in South San Francisco. She's from New York city originally. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so we had a lot of fun, but Melody was on here as well, early on, and I think you went to bed. I remember you dropped off to also go and uh, get dinner for your kids. Melody lives in Atlanta. She's three hours ahead of my time zone. Here she is, Melody in the house right here. <laughs> Waving at you as well. Awesome, very cool. That, that was fun though. We, we, we had a good time, we had a good time. I'll do it again, actually. I, I really enjoyed it, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Uh, uh, and then uh, Melody wrote here, it was such a blessing to reconnect with you uh, and the students. It was fun. It was fun. And uh, I'm looking forward to having you in our program. Uh, and then I gave away a couple of things for free. Uh, my team randomly chose people and Melody won the gold version. So she'll be, it will be starting December 14th. To learn more, you can go to this website here. Thanks. All right. Uh, I love my students. Uh, next up, Charlotte is saying... Um, while doing your course, which I'm extremely grateful to be a part of, thank you. Uh, and this is also incredible and so helpful, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned uh, uh, types of business uh, setups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so uh, there, there's various ways that you can incorporate um, you know, your, your, your company. Uh, I recommend talking to a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I recommend that you register your company uh, if it's something you want to take seriously, because I don't want you to get sued if, God forbid, something bad happens outside of your control. You know, I, I don't want you to lose your house, your car, your whatever it is, the quality of life for your family, etc. Uh, and so I always recommend registering your company as well to protect you uh, and your loved ones uh, as, as, as well. Yeah. Uh, and you can register as an LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, uh, a C Corp, an S Corp, et cetera. And every country is a little bit different, but the basis of legal code when it comes to starting companies is somewhat similar globally, kind of like finance and accounting is similar globally, which is why I teach very generically. Now, in terms of my setup, I started as an LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, because I wanted my liabilities to be limited. Then what I did was I changed it to an S Corporation for certain tax reasons. Everyone's a little bit different. Now, if I want to take my company public, which I'll never do, I'll never take outside money and I've gotten a lot of offers. But if I ever want to take my company public, I'd have to change to a C Corp because in a C Corp, you can have many more owners of a company. And so a lot of companies I've been on the boards of uh, here in venture capital in the Bay Area, tech companies, um, what they've done is they started out as an LLC, Limited Liability Corporation. And eventually, right before they go public, they change to a C Corp so that more people can own parts of the company, meaning common shareholders. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, next up, Van is saying, hello, Chris, and congratulations for webcast 110. Thank you. I can't believe it. 110 weeks. 110 weeks. It's getting better. Every week, we're pushing the goalpost out every, every week. Okay, great. Uh, and then Jamin uh, Patel is saying, Chris, thank you for the passionate teaching. You, you're, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. And... I think you're the same Jay that was on, on the webcast last Friday and you wowed all of us with your brilliance. Um, unbelievable. And, and I want you to write that book like I mentioned uh, because I want to read it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you are brilliant. And thank you for, for being here. And thank you for also signing up for the, uh, the platinum version of, of the program. Look, looking forward to working with you and learning from you. Yeah. Amazing Science 360 is saying, Hi, Chris. How can I network with people? Yeah. So the, the best advice I can give you is go to my website, 
haroonventures.com. Download my networking book. It's a couple hundred pages. It's free. And there's a couple hours of YouTube videos that are clickable through there. It'll teach you all of my secrets based on my success and many of my uh, many of my failures as well. And, and you've seen this one over and over again. My wonderful quote from Michael Jordan. And the reason my, my desk goes up, oh, it's a little, a little off here, is because what, what I do is um, I actually, when I'm writing lectures, what I do is it's like a Michael Bay production. Uh, he made Transformers, I think, yeah. Um, I, 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 this goes up, I take my chair off, uh, and then I go onto my, uh, my, my stepper, my walker, a little treadmill under the desk here, a cheap one. And I get my 20,000 steps in every day doing that. Yeah. So, cause if this doesn't work, this won't work. That's how I get my exercise. In. Yeah. All right. And I don't even realize I'm, I'm, I'm doing my 20,000 steps. It, it goes by really, really fast. All right. All right, um, and a melody, um, uh, Manas is asking, what's the name of your course on Udemy? If you enter the name in here, please. Uh, so we, we um, yeah, yeah, so everybody knows, thanks. Next up, Jose, how are you? Jose is one of my amazing platinum uh, MBA degree students. Uh, he's originally from Venezuela. Uh, he lives in Brooklyn with his wife uh, and his six-year-old daughter. Uh, he's a great guy. He's an expert in the oil sector. Um, he used to work uh, on offshore rigs. Um, he's a great salesperson as well, very personable, very intelligent. And he started a badass payment processing company. Uh, and he's able to network as well. Even with COVID in New York, he's networked and gotten networking meetings using Zoom. He's awesome. He's an inspiration. Love you, brother. Great to have you. So Jose wrote, Chris, what would you recommend to hold a sales team accountable uh, of their quotas? Do you think a daily report uh, can work? Thanks. Yeah. So daily reports are are, are tough, um, and it can be. It's kind of stressful. Like when I used to work at Citadel, every day at one sixteen, uh, I would get an email saying how much each analyst or portfolio manager made that day. Great disclosure. It's kind of stressful, uh, but they're they're successful. It works for them. What I do with brand new employees, by the way, a lot of times, is and I don't believe in micromanaging. But early on, it's kind of helpful to keep tabs on employees just to help them as well. So every day, what I would do with new employees, especially because my employees work remotely, I'd have them send me an email with three things in it as follows. Number one, what did you accomplish today? Number two, what are you going to accomplish tomorrow? And number three, do you have any issues or questions? Now, but when it comes to, to quotas, um, I think monthly is is usually what I, what I would look at. Uh, and, and what you can do is if you have a, a CRM system uh, where people document their deals, you can find out how close they are to, to closing deals or have they closed deals, uh, et cetera. So I, I, I would do it monthly. I would do it monthly, yeah. Um, that's just me, though. All right. Uh, and then uh, John, John McDonald, uh, and, and it, actually there's there a, a Toronto Blue Jays player played second base named John McDonald. Really, really nice guy. Really good at fielding. Uh, but John McDonald is saying, hi, Chris. Uh, good to see you. Likewise. Uh, sorry, I've been spamming your, your social media uh, a, a, accounts. Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't noticed. I'm so sorry. I, I get so many inbounds on a lot of my platforms. I, I, I haven't noticed. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, Al, Albus is saying, um, oh, that, that's awesome. I think regarding something we talked about earlier. Thank you. Asamina in the house. Asamina is our amazing video game developer. She's originally from Greece. Uh, and she actually is joining our platinum program uh, for my MBA degree program. You, you won the scholarship. We gave away one platinum last week. That's right. Uh, and so uh, Asamina wrote, hello, Chris. Hope all is well. Thank you for the opportunity to study with you. Uh, Friday's open house was amazing. Thank you, Asamina. Thank you. And dude, I think you stayed on longer than anybody uh, on, on Zoom uh, throughout the night as well. And, and I hope you're feeling healthy and great. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to working with you uh, in the MBA degree program. Asamina is making a badass open world concept video game. Uh, I can't wait to see it. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, and then Charlotte is saying, I really could go 
uh, with the British equivalent of business types like LLP or limited and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And I would talk to a local attorney if you can uh, in the United Kingdom as well. They would definitely be able to help you out. Yeah. I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then Amazing Science is saying, uh, what is that drink which you shake before drinking and how do you prepare it? Yeah. So, so what I actually do is um, I'm pretty organized with, with, with my, my diet. Um, every night or a lot of nights before I go to bed, I prepare four drinks. And the coffee, it's, it's on the coffee machine, so it gets prepared automatically. And let me just rise this up a bit so you, 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 you can see. There you go. Okay. So this, this one here, th th I'll do it in this order here. This one here is, uh, it's, in, it's got every antioxidant you can think of in it. Now, because I'm so jammed and it's hard for me to find time to prepare uh, a lot of my meals, um, I subscribe to a service called dailyharvest.com. And every week uh, I get seven little packages of organic food. A lot of vegetables, no meats at all. Uh, but uh, avocado, kale, all that stuff. And it's frozen as well. It comes frozen in the package. So I, I put that in. And then what I do is, uh, after pouring those contents, it gets up to here. Then I put in, um, uh, I, I put in whey protein, okay? I, which is just egg whites, uh, powder format. I put in a special um, organic-based uh, green powder. I put a couple other things as well. I don't want to go into detail on it. Uh, the mushroom ex extracts, actually, for cognitive abilities. I do shrimps in this drink. I, I mean, I also put in acai, uh, which is a wonderful South American uh, fruit, which um, a lot of extreme sports enthusiasts uh, consume. Uh, I, I put in um, uh, flax seeds as well. You have to do that if you're a guy uh, for anti-cancer reasons. You can't reverse aging, but you can slow it down a lot. And you can present or prevent um, uh, diseases uh, by consuming the right foods. And what I want you to do is check out to see what in your family, like your, your aunts, uncles, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, what diseases did they get? Because there's a chance you might get that and you can nip it in the butt. And years ago, I had my DNA sequenced. And they found out that with a high degree of probability, my eyesight's going to go down through a process called AMD or age uh, macro generation. So I, I take a very uh, benign zinc substance as well to nip it in the butt. So I never get that. It's like the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise, where there's the pre-crime group, great movie from 2002 with Spielberg. There's the pre-crime group, which determines they could see what crimes you're going to commit in life, life later, which is moronic, but it was a cool sci-fi movie. That's what I think about with my, my, my diet. I'm not going to get certain diseases later in life, hopefully, knock on wood, because of the, this sort of thing. And there's a bunch of other stuff I, I put in here as well. Omega fish oil as well. Super EFA liquid I, I buy. Uh, that's that. Um, uh, ne next up, um, these two are the same. It's just water with um, uh, organic, uh, a very small amount of organic um, uh, green vegetable uh, extract in it. It tastes good. It's kind of like, like I have this one for, for backup. Um, this is called uh, suja, uh, organic juice uh, as well. Yeah, so here's that. So, so these two are, are the same. Okay. And this one here is my Bulletproof Coffee, uh, which I talked about earlier in the webcast, uh, which is just coffee with uh, organic grass-fed butter uh, in it, uh, and then MCT oil, coconut oil, just to give me better cognitive ability so I can speak gooder. And I put them off on the side here just so that they're, they're out, of, uh, out of shot uh, with, with my A camera. You can see it here with, with, with the C camera here. Yeah. Hey there. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, ne next up. Um, okay. Uh, Charlotte is asking about charities uh, with, with legal structures. I, I, I don't know how to create a 501c in America, although I'm on the boards of charities. I know it's different uh, in, in England where you live. It's called something different from 501c. I would just talk to, um, to talk to an attorney. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, John, thank you, man. I, I appreciate that. 
Thank you so much for that. John said, uh, hi, Chris, you're awesome. Remember we met uh, last year. Uh, uh, just wanted to make sure I could still have you on my board of advisors. Uh, you don't need to do anything uh, as, as I follow all your content. Thank you. For, I appreciate Of course, put me on there as well. Oh, you're from Canada as well. I, I, I see. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to help out. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, and then Manas is saying um, the name of the book that uh, Manas is writing is called Bonds Over Business. And the course is called a 10 in one public speaking course. Thanks for the support. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm going to buy your course and let me go, let's go, let's go together and, and see the book, uh, that, that, that Manas, um, uh, uh, made here, uh, and let's all buy it together or, or check it out together. So amazon.com, um, and Amazon's going to be broken up. I think after the election, I think the Trump administration wanted to break them up earlier, but they can't because Amazon's doing great things with delivery for COVID reasons. But I do believe that Amazon is too powerful now. uh, And I think it'll be uh, broken up into Amazon online ordering company for for shopping. uh, And then Amazon Web Services, Kindle, et cetera, Alexa. Okay, so so Manas wrote a book here. Uh, It's called um, Bonds. Oh, I like that. Over Business. And let's do a search here. Oh, here it is. Dude, good for you. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. Oh my God, that 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 is awesome. Buy now. Excellent. I'm going to get it, dude. It comes Sunday. Uh, I, I, I'm going to read it. Um, and then uh, I will, um, I'll bring it on the next call, man. But, but congratulations, buddy. Congrats. That, that's awesome. And I also am going to buy your, your Udemy course uh, as well. Congrats, man. Good for you. Does it feel good to write a book? Anybody can do it. And imagine how good it feels to go to a job interview or an informational meeting or meeting with a customer or potential customer. And you bring your book with you and you give it to them. Who does that? You got to ask yourself, how badly do you want that customer or that job? Congratulations, Benas. I know you've been working very hard on it. And for anybody else that wants to write a book, you can use my template, which is free. Uh, and so you can write a book in six inch by nine inch format. Just go to haroonventures.com. That's haroonventures.com slash all lowercase one word, write book, W R I T E B O O K. Uh, and you can download that template. Good for you, dude. I can't wait to, to read it. Uh, I am going to read it before next Thursday's call. And I'm also going to bring it and profile on the air. Congratulations. I know you've been working hard on it. Feels good, eh? All right, cool. All right, all right. Um, uh, next up, um, uh, Corey Lepati is asking, "Hi, Professor, uh, are you a CF- CFA charter holder?" I am not. Uh, so, those of you not familiar with CFA, it stands for uh, Certified Financial Analyst. And in order to be a CFA or to be a CFA charter holder, you have to take three exams over three years. You don't have to go to classes; you just write three exams. And they give you a bunch of textbooks to read. Don't buy any of the textbooks. What I want you to do instead is I want you to go to uh, eBay and for 30 bucks, buy used books from a company called Schweizer. Uh, that, that's, that's what I did for, for level one. I did level one and I found that it was just repetitive based on stuff I had already learned in business school and working on Wall Street. So I stopped doing it. Uh, but uh, it's a very respected designation. I think it's more respected and better than an MBA. That's right. And my networking book just fell. And, that, and lo and behold, you can see now my lens. That, that's my lens I, I, I hold the book up with there. What did I say wrong there? I said CFA is better than an MBA and it fell down. That's probably somebody telling me, Chris, don't, you're trying to sell your MBA product here. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, but, but I did level one and I actually did it. Uh, I, I wrote it after 9-11. Um, in, when I was at Goldman Sachs, Goldman paid for it and everything. I wrote it in, in, um, it was really eerie actually. Um, right after 9-11, um, we wrote it, um, a couple, like a month or so afterwards, whatever it was, maybe it was January the following year in 02, but we wrote it in New Jersey and we were all put uh, into a room with 5,000 people, this warehouse to write it. And before the exam started, we all had to stand up and they had a minute of silence for everybody that, that passed away in 9-11. And then they read the names of the people that have CFAs uh, that, that died. 
Um, and that list went on forever. God, it was just a, a lot of them worked at Cantor Fitzgerald. Very sad point in, in human history. Yeah, yeah. But I do respect the CFA qu quite a bit. All right. Put this back up here. There we go. There we go. All right. Um, next up, uh, question is, um, would you kindly share your email address so that we can communicate regularly? Uh, I'm from South Africa and I run a not-for-profit not business that supports a, a number of small businesses. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I, I don't disclose that, but, but thank you. You can always ask me questions on this, on this weekly call uh, if you want to. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Manas is, is saying, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Apple got some summons from the United States government because they're monopolizing their powers. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that, I, th I, think, I, I think that those companies should be broken up, especially Amazon, because competition is good for the consumer. Um, and Amazon, after we're done with COVID, I wouldn't break them up before, before that because they're doing good things, uh, delivering packages to many people that are self-quarantined. Yeah. Uh, but I do believe that Amazon's got to be broken up uh, because a lot of people only buy stuff from Amazon now. You know, it's terrible for, for, for competition as well. So... That, that's what I would say. Um, now, in, in terms of Google, absolutely, they should be broken up as well uh, into a couple companies, Google Search, YouTube, and then other. And, and people don't realize that, that Google's got, a, they're pretty strong in enterprise software as well. Um, but it, it's not fair that Google has a monopoly on their app store, so to speak, Google Play. The same thing with Apple. It's not fair that Apple pushes Apple Music on all consumers. It's not fair to Pandora and Spotify. It's not fair that Apple pushes their video game arcade subscription service to you. And, and we see that, that innovation is dying uh, on the App Store. Like I remember when the iPhone, iPad, et cetera, first came out, every week I'd be downloading new games. It was fun. Great games like Field Runners 1, Field Runners 2, all the great tower defense games. Dude, there's no innovation. There are no great games or new great new products, hardly any at least, from an innovation perspective, uh, on, on the Apple Store anymore. And it, it, it's not fair. And it's partially because of their monopoly power. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I, I think those three companies should be broken up. Microsoft, I don't know as much anymore. I mean, I remember that uh, Janet Reno, a district attorney, wanted, wanted to break up Microsoft in 1999 into two different entities, Windows and Office or Windows and everything else. Um, they weren't successful in doing so. Um, I don't think that Office is as powerful today as it was back in the late 90s because a lot of people use Google Docs, et cetera, or, or free, uh, free applications online. So I'm not, I'm not so sure about Microsoft being broken up. Yeah. All right. Um, and then Gregory, Gregory from Europe, how are you? Gregory is saying 110 a weeks. Uh, congratulations, Chris. Thank you. Appreciate that. Crazy, eh? 110 weeks. Unbelievable. It's been fun, though. And we're going to do thousands more. And the battery just stopped working on this, so i got to put it back in the, in the charger over here. Give me one second. Urgh. All right, my coffee cup is getting charged now. Next question is, uh, thanks dear professor, uh, what you teach is easy to understand and important, uh, more important than those others on YouTube. Uh, and and you, thank you, you to me. Uh, thanks a lot for, for sharing your crucial knowledge. My, my pleasure, my pleasure. And if anybody wants to teach courses similar to my courses on, on Udemy, uh, go to Udemy and do a search at the very bottom and just show one star ratings on my courses. Five is good, one is bad. There's tons of them. And you can make better courses than mine uh, and the student wins. So it's win-win. I also have free courses to teach you how to teach online. Uh, next up, uh, Christina. Oh, Christina is saying, thank you, Chris, uh, for your record-breaking Haroon Education's MBA degree program 2021 live open house last week. 
Uh, it was great to be part uh, of both uh, your YouTube and Zoom live calls, and you signed up for Platinum, you wrote here. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to having you uh, and your husband, actually, um, uh, in this program. It was great meeting you and your daughter as well. She's adorable. She's seven years old, you mentioned on, on the call. Uh, it, it was great having you. Uh, and for those of you not familiar with Christina, she's brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. Oh, by the way, Christina, Jay signed up as well. He was on the call. He's amazing. Um, she's brilliant. Um, she used to live in New York, uh, and uh, now she lives here in South San Francisco. And I'm looking forward to meeting you hopefully one day as well uh, as we go through those one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, in the MBA degree program. We can do it in person if you want to, if COVID ever goes away. Completely up to you. I'm happy to do it with masks on as well. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, it'll be fun. And by the way, my, my, my three kids, uh, I live in San Francisco Bay Area, um, for these two kids, schools are still closed, so they're being homeschooled. This guy here, um, he just went back to school today for the first time. They just opened the school, so hopefully it works well. Uh, we have a whole process when he comes home that washes hands and stuff, and they have these, uh, my kids go to public schools. I, I don't believe in private schools, that's just me. Uh, but there, there's plastic things around their desks as well, so they don't, yeah. All right. Um, uh, and next up, uh, uh, Nawale is saying, I have another question. Is it okay if you haven't realized your passion yet and how do you find it? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it takes time, man. Like for me, it took me until my 40s to realize that teaching is my passion. It takes time. And we change as well. Like a lot of people, they, they love something at one point in their lives and they do that as their career. And then eventually it turns into a job and they hate it and they reinvent themselves. You can reinvent yourself, yourself over and over again. The best way to think of what your passion is, is basically to think about if, if, you, were, if you were given a month off and you can't travel and you're not allowed to go to school and you're not allowed to work, what would you do with your time? That is your passion. No matter what anybody says, don't listen to anybody else. Do what you were meant to do on this earth. Great quote here I've got uh, from uh, Mark Twain, which is the two most important days in your life are number one, the day you're born, and number two, the day you find out why. Whatever you're passionate about, that's what you were meant to do on this planet. That's your raison d'etre. And if I can humbly help you get closer to realizing your dreams in life, career-wise, et cetera, then I've done my job. Uh, and if you sign up for my MBA degree program, the Platinum program, there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. Three hours, actually, that, that, that goes, that, that's part of the Platinum program. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, and then Pratik is saying, honestly, I would play GTA 5 if I get a holiday for, for a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And dude, I've seen modded out GTA 5, which looks dope. It's amazing. And they're going to re-release GTA 5 on, on the PlayStation 5 and Xbox soon. I think next year. Uh, a modded out version. And then GTA 6, hopefully the year after that. Yeah. It, it is an amazing game, though. It is incredible. Yeah. But Trevor in that game, he's Canadian. But not all Canadians are like Trevor. I just want to put that out there, okay? All right, uh, and then Gregory uh, from, from Europe wrote, uh, whoa, 12 hours for the open house. Bravo, thank you. It was fun, it was fun. Um, uh, and then uh, Pratik is saying, um, I, would, I, 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 love, I would stream live on YouTube. So is that my passion? Uh, question mark. Yeah, whatever you're passionate about, you can teach about it live here on YouTube. You know, a lot of people make a career out of it uh, using Twitch. You know, my, my, my son... Uh, one of my kids here, this guy here, uh, because COVID, he was you know bored in the house, stuck at home. Uh, and so he started streaming. He's actually made a lot of money from it. He's done great. He's bought equipment for himself and stuff as well, uh, streaming uh, Minecraft, teaching Minecraft. It's kind of fun. And, and I think all kids should play Minecraft because it's like a software development kit, an SDK, um, where you, there's if-then logic. You know, if, if somebody flips a switch in Minecraft, it opens a door, which is like programming. It's cool. And my son, uh, my youngest one, actually, he goes to code.org and he codes using Minecraft, right? There's a visual drag and drop coding based system to learn how to program using Minecraft, which is fun and it's free. 
All right. Um, uh, next up, um, let's see here. All right, awesome. Everybody else is buying Manasseh's book. It's great to see. All right. Um, and hold on one second, guys, please. Okay, great. All right. Uh, uh, next up, and, and then uh, Manas is saying he wants to give me a coupon to get his Udemy course for free on LinkedIn. No, I'm going to buy it. It's already in my shopping cart. I support my students. Next up, Caesar is saying, uh, hi, Chris, I'm Caesar, and I'm from Montreal, Canada. Excellent. Great to have you. I went to McGill, had a great time there. That's where I learned how to I had I learned stuff at school there. It was fun. Uh, drinking age is 18. I remember that at, at McGill. Yeah, yeah. You wrote, uh, I, I'm, I'm really proud to say uh, that, that I'm from Montreal uh, and I'm uh, uh, super great courses um, that you've published, uh, like the Financial Analyst course. Thank you. Thank you, Caesar. G great to have I miss Montreal, man. I love it. Montreal is my favorite city in the world in the summer, in the summer. I remember when I went to undergrad there, I remember freezing my ass off walking to bars, and for some reason, I wasn't cold on the way home. Yeah, yeah, I had so much fun. The Peel Pub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, I had good times there. It, and Montreal is the closest you'll get to Europe in North America uh, as well. I, I love it. It's very European city. So much fun. Yeah. And people don't realize it's called Montreal because uh, in French, Montreal is Mont Royal. Uh, there's, a, there's a hill in the middle of the city, Mount Royal, Montreal. Yeah. Next up, Harris is saying, uh, hey, Chris, can you throw some light on how to disperse uh, dividends briefly or dividend policy? Yeah. Um, so, I, I, I mean, for publicly traded companies, a lot of companies that, that aren't growing as quickly anymore, value-based investments, they offer dividends uh, every, every quarter. Um, so I don't, I don't really know if I could help much with that other than to say that there's an ex-dividend process whereby uh, when dividend is declared, you don't get it for a day or two. It's called ex-dividend. And sometimes people, companies will offer special dividends like Microsoft in the fall of 2003. Uh, they did a one-time special dividend, um, which basically caused the stock, stock to go up a lot and then drop by the exact same dollar amount of that special one-time dividend they did. Yeah. And quite often companies that are very cash rich, uh, they're pressured by investors to either buy back shares, right? So that the, uh, the, the valuation of the company goes down from a PE perspective. They're pressured to either buy back shares or issue a dividend. Uh, and so all wonderful growth companies, growth slows a lot and growth investors want to sell the stock. And so in order to attract value investors, uh, you know, companies can, can issue dividends. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, question from Shri. Uh, which is, hey, Chris, how do you approach uh, making future assumptions in models for valuation? Any tips on how to be comfortable with your assumptions? Yeah, yeah. It's tough. It's tough because accounting is basically, it's, it's like a science. You look backwards. But finance, what you're talking about here, it's like an art. You're predicting the future and you have to be comfortable with uncertainty. Uh, and so the best way to, uh, and I teach you a lot about this in, in my MBA degree program, but the best way to forecast the future when it comes to financial financials is to focus on one thing, revenue. And so you forecast revenue into the future. And then what happens is most other items becomes a percent of revenue. And the way to figure out what percent of revenue each item should be is to go to uh, annual reports of companies that are similar to the one you're creating a financial model for and see what percent of revenue sales and marketing is, uh, G&A, general administrative expenses, R&D, et cetera. That's what I would do. I would look at revenue first and then make most other items a percent of revenue. Yeah. Uh, and so in terms of your assumptions, and you can get lost pretty quickly uh, by, by creating a model and you might think, why did I create this line item here? or this percent of revenue here. So what you wanna do is if you use the Windows version of Excel, you hit Shift uh, Shift F2 to insert a comment. Comment your code, they say, just like comment your models. On a Mac, you can't do Shift F2. You just right click and go insert comment. 
And I teach you this in more detail uh, in my MBA degree program as well. All right, uh, next up, Pratik is saying, how should we make our first course? Uh, with a green screen or set up a studio like yours or, or set up uh, newspapers uh, like Manas? So, so what I recommend, so what you can do is, I, I, I have a couple of free courses on, on Udemy. Just search for my name in Udemy and go to my profile and you can take uh, free courses on how to teach online on Udemy based on mistakes I've made so you can work smarter, not harder. Um, I don't recommend green screen. I don't recommend it because it's really hard to get a perfect green screen. I recommend just having a white backdrop, which is how I did my first 30 courses, I think. That's what I would recommend, just a simple white backdrop. And in terms of how to set up the, the camera equipment, your iPhone, whatever it is, take my courses, uh, the free ones, please, on, on Udemy on, on how to teach online. Now, I want you to use what you have uh, and save as much money as you can. Uh, in my, my first lighting system, what I did was I, I paid 100 bucks or 150 bucks, I think, and I bought uh, a lighting kit uh, from a company called Westcott Basics. And basically, it's one light there, one light there. That's it. And then behind me, what I did was I got an old lamp uh, and, I, and I took the lampshade off and I put it down on the ground below me, far enough from, away from the wall so it didn't start a fire. And uh, it kind of created a 3D pop for me as well. Uh, and then I've since learned uh, more sophisticated stuff through trial and error and many failures. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Um, all right. Uh, next up, Karthik is asking, Hi, Chris. Uh, I'm confused uh, with what I should do in life. Uh, I'm in the software industry. I'm not sure whether I should be a technical programmer or a manager. Um, how can I find the answer uh, by myself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just got to think about what you're most passionate about in life, whatever you enjoy the most. Um, and if it's neither of those, then, you know, think about it maybe a different type of career path. And, and what I recommend my students do is to write down what your perfect life is in 10 years and don't hold back, go all out, okay? And then once you figure out what your perfect life is, there is a gap. Here's where I am now, here's where I want to be. How do you fill that gap? And if it's a different career than you have now in a different industry, then I recommend networking using the, the contents of this book, which is free on networking. You can get it from my website, haroonventures.com. Networking aggressively to find people that work in that career that you might be interested in and get informational meetings with them and ask them what it's like. Ask them what it's like, yeah. And when it comes to a fork in the road and deciding which way should I go, two different paths, um, I recommend using Microsoft Excel and creating two columns. And in column one, do the one path, column two, do the other path and quantify it. And you can go to my YouTube page and just do a search on difficult decisions because I go through how to quantify that in a lot of detail in a previous vlog. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then Karlik is also saying, do you think that value investing still works? Um, can I practice both value and growth investing at the same time? I mean, technically, yeah. I, I do think value investing still works. The reason why it might appear that value investing has not worked out well over the past six or 12 months is because the market is you know, close to an all-time high, whatever. Uh, and when the market goes up a lot, people tend to buy what's working, which is growth stocks. Uh, but value stocks and value investing works in the long run. Um, if you're curious about what kind of stocks to think about investing in, uh, you can always do a search for what is Warren Buffett's portfolio. And Warren Buffett, of course, is the quintessential value investor. But you gotta be long-term focused. It's tough to be both value and growth at the same time. You're either one or the other. Um, but when you're creating a portfolio, if you want to be diversified, I think it might make sense to consider different asset classes that have different volatility metrics as well. All right, next up is uh, uh, Kaiser George is saying, hi, sir. Uh, hello, uh, call me Chris, please. Uh, most of the financial uh, giants are urging that the future is blockchain cryptos and cryptos. Kindly share your views on the same. Thanks. Yeah, I, I do believe uh, in, in the cryptocurrency market. I do. 
Um, however, I do think that most cryptocurrencies are a scam and there's been a lot of manipulation and that there will be a day of reckoning and a lot of people will go to jail. A lot of people, what they've been doing is they've been pumping and dumping. They've been using YouTube to tell everybody what cryptos to buy. Then everyone buys them. Then they tell everyone to sell. Everyone sells and then they buy it back again, rinse, lather, repeat over and over and over again. You got to read the investor offering memorandum for, for every type of investment, including cryptos before investing. If you can't get an investor offering memorandum, don't invest, don't invest. But I do believe that the future of money is, is going to be digital to the extent that it's more secure. Um, and the, the problem with traditional paper-based currency or fiat currency, as they call it, is it's been a monopoly for thousands of years. And because of that, and monopolies get lazy, they don't innovate. Uh, and so I think that currencies in the future are going to be crypto and fiat together at the same time, meaning the paper-based currency you have will have a crypto element to it as well, making it more secure, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I, I, I do believe in the future of cryptos and blockchain. And blockchain is not just a way to transact in, in cryptos or to, you know, mine new cryptos. It, it, it's, also, it's also a way for you to share information securely, like elections, data, contracts, et cetera. Yeah. And for more details, you can take my uh, cryptocurrency course if you want uh, on Udemy. Um, or take, um, you can take Kirill's course on cryptocurrency blockchain on how to create a blockchain. Uh, on Udemy as well. Yeah. All right. And I put some um, I put some dark chocolate uh, in in my drink today, so it tastes tastes really good. Yeah. All right. All right. My my coffee is now warm again. Very quiet. It, don't buy this. It's called Ember. Don't buy this. So the battery sucks on it. Yeah. All right. Next question um, I've got is from uh, Mustafa. Hey, Mustafa. Ho hope you're doing well. The question is, I read your networking book. Um, this, this one here. Uh, it's free on my website. Yeah. And it's invaluable. Thank you. I reached out to a prospect and he responded, I'd love to learn more. How should I respond? Um, I would strike while the iron's hot and set up a, a, a meeting in person for coffee or tea or Zoom. That's what I would do. Uh, and then when you meet with them online or in person, whatever it is, uh, make sure you bond in the first 10 minutes. You always bond before business. Talk about what you have in common. Go to their Twitter profile, see who they follow, and that will kind of help you crystallize your thought process when it comes to what you should talk about in the meeting when you're bonding. You know, maybe they follow sports teams. You can kind of talk about that. You, you, obviously, you don't say, I was stalking you on your Twitter profile. And I noticed you follow these companies. Make it natural. <laughs> Make it natural, please. Yeah. Uh, that, that's what I would do. And then eventually after, I don't know, 10 or 20 meetings, whatever it is, or 10 or 20 minutes, they'll say nicely, why are we meeting? And that's when you go in for the ask. All right, Suzanne is next, is saying, forgive me uh, if someone asks this. No, please, no worries. What is the difference between uh, the Udemy master degree in one course uh, and the uh, $1,400 uh, one year program you wrote uh, uh, on your website? Yeah. So uh, the Udemy course you're talking about is called um, an entire MBA in one course. It's an eight hour long course uh, versus. Um, uh, the Haroon uh, MBA degree program. Let me go there with you to HaroonMBA.com. Okay, I'll show you. So we go to, okay. So um, this, this program here, and I'll run through it here uh, on this page. Um, so it's, yeah. So it, it's, it's a 300 hour uh, a degree program and it's, uh, it's not accredited. I'll never accredit it because I don't want anybody telling me what I can and can't teach. And if I accredit it, it's going to cost you thousands and thousands of dollars, more like 10 grand. And also, you're going to learn stuff that's not relevant because educational standards bodies make you have certain content that is so outdated. Yeah. 
Okay. And most university programs are expensive, inflexible, outdated, as I mentioned. Um, you can take this on your own terms uh, anytime you want to. Everything is, is recorded as well. And we do live classes if you can make it live, which is great, but you don't have to. I teach you based on, on my real life practical experience. There's over 300 hours of, of, of lessons. Um, it's pass fail. Uh, and I did that because I believe in a, uh, I believe in a collegial culture where people work together uh, instead of sharks, which is what happens with business school usually. Um, and so as I scroll down here, uh, I'll show you a little bit more about this. Um, there's a 30 day, hundred percent money back guarantee that you get up until 30 days after we start, meaning by January 14th. Um, yeah, I, I actually, in the platinum program, I personally work with you and write your LinkedIn profile. That's right. You get three hours of one-on-one -on -one time with me, uh, is, as well. Um, now you don't have to watch all 300 hours. Um, just pick and choose what you want. And after each class, there's a really simple short quiz. Um, and all you have to do is get over 50% on the average of all quizzes to, to pass the, the, the program. Yeah. Um, uh, and so uh, with, within the program, there's five tracks that you have to take all the courses in. There's finance and accounting. Uh, and I teach you based on real life practical experience, having worked at Goldman Sachs uh, on Wall Street. Uh, worked working in, in the in the consulting industry. I worked in the financial services consulting industry in tech at Accenture. Yeah, you know, I worked in venture capital. Uh, I, I started a venture capital and hedge fund, uh, and I've sat in the boards of many companies as well. So I'll teach you finance and accounting from that perspective in a fun, differentiated way with lots of props. You'll love it or your money back. Uh, the second track of five is entrepreneurship, where I'll teach you how to start a company. Now, most business schools, people go to business school. And the day they graduate, if you ask them, hey, do you know how to start a company now? They're like, well, they didn't really teach me that. I'll put you through my venture capital boot camp in the third of four semesters. Okay. So it's a one-year program. Uh, and yes, you can work full-time and still do it and take it at your own time and your own at your own terms. Uh, and if you want, you can do it over a couple of years as well, right? This is a, a flexible degree program. So it's entrepreneurship. And if you want to work in a big company, I also teach you how to start different departments, products and services in, in a big company as well in the entrepreneurship track. We do a lot of case studies. Uh, these are the traitorous eight here. The people that um, that helped the American government put the first uh, man on the moon. Yeah, uh, this this was uh, they created the, the processors there or, or the memory. Yeah. And then they went on to start a bunch of them. Gordon Moore, who's here started Intel, one with Andy Grove. Yeah. And, and Eugene Kleiner for Kleiner Perkins. He's, um, he, he's right here, um, which is a great venture capital firm as well. Yeah. We do a lot, a lot of case studies, personal growth. I help you become much more productive and happier too. Um, and we study some of the best entrepreneurs from a personal growth perspective and why they became successful as well. There's no theory in this degree program. You're not going to see supply and demand charts like they do in economics, which nobody uses unless you're an economist. I teach you advanced sales, marketing, and communication skills um, as well. You know, how to present uh, online uh, and, and how to write um, business for business purposes, et cetera, and much, much more as well. We, we have a lot of fun. And we study a lot of um, social media platforms as well and how to use them uh, in order to, to, to become more successful. And actually, let me actually... Um, let me let me get out of this mode here, and I'll come back to that in a second. I'll show you what I'm teaching right now, uh, next class uh, for, for for my students. Okay. So let me go over here, and I'm going to close this presentation I've got here just to show you what what the next class is going to be for my, my my students. So let me hit escape here, and this is just by the way behind me. Uh, this here is just PowerPoint. So let me go here, and let me go to open recent, and. This here is for, like this is it here. Yeah, right here, yeah. So uh, next class uh, I'm teaching um, how to sell uh, online. Uh, and so for my, my MBA degree students in my platinum program, this is, you could earmuffs if you, if you want and not be surprised, uh, but I'm teaching you, and this is sales, marketing, and communications. Uh, semester four, class number five. Uh, and so, and so what, what I'm teaching, and, and I always say at the beginning of each class, please have 
uh, your workbook open in either Microsoft Word format, uh, Adobe PDF, or Google Docs. I always provide workbooks in three formats so that you can take notes, answer questions if you want to. Uh, if I provide you with questions to answer, uh, interactive exercises, you can use an iPhone, Android handset, a tablet, your television, a desktop, a laptop, etc. It all works the same. I've customized it so it works for everybody. Um, and then um, on, on Monday, we'll be 82% of the way through the MBA degree program. I, I always kick it off with a quote. Uh, this one's from Seth Godin, who, who said, don't find customers for your product, find products for your customers. He's awesome. Then the three topics we're going to talk about on Monday are, number one, introduction to the Haroon Education Ventures, 15 C's of selling online. That's topic one. We always do three topics. Topic two, I talk about the first five of them. Topic three, I talk about the next 10. So in, in terms of topic one, I'll just run through one slide here. So topic one uh, of the, the 15 C's, the first C is contacting customers. And I go through um, my favorite ways to use applications to get a ton of customers quickly. Uh, and so here I, I talk about something called active campaign, which is like uh, MailChimp at higher end. I talk about ClickFunnels, Thrivecart, a bunch of new products as well that teach you how, how to get customers. Um, and, and, and I teach you relevant stuff and I'll always be updating the MBA degree program as well if new social media platforms come out that can help you grow your business. We talk about cross-selling and upselling. Uh, and, and so when you go to McDonald's, at the top there you see cross-sell, uh, right, right, right here. When, when you go to McDonald's, um, you know, they always ask you, would you like fries like with that? Would you like a Coke with that? And the reason is, and they, that's what cross-selling is. Because at McDonald's, uh, which is a, one of the many case studies we do, they don't make money on hamburgers. They lose money on hamburgers, which is why they always say, would you like fries? Because they make a tiny profit margin on that. And they always say, would you like a Coke with that or a drink with that? Because that's very high profit margins. That's cross-selling. Upselling, uh, which is right here, is the process of selling a more expensive product to your existing customers, uh, which is the basis for that open house webcast I did last week. Uh, we talk about a bunch of tech companies like AdRoll, which uses retargeted based practices. So AdRoll is, is a company that was backed by uh, Peter Thiel, great uh, venture capital investor. He was the first investor in Facebook. And AdRoll, what it does is this. You ever, you ever go to a website and you see an ad and you're like, oh my gosh, how do they know I want to buy that? And then you go to another website and you're like, oh my gosh, the same ad. How do they know? That's a process called retargeting. That's a technology you can use an ad roll. Okay. But I, I don't want to go into too much detail uh, on this right now because I, I just want to answer questions for all of you. Uh, then we talk about the carrot, uh, how to get people to give you their email address through maybe offering a book or something. Yeah. Uh, then I talk about what's called a call to action, uh, content, content is king, um, delivery is queen, that, that sort of thing. So that's, that's a quick sample on, on what I'm doing uh, on Monday for, for, for my MBA degree students. Let me now go um, and close out this presentation and open up the other one I had, which is right here, week 110. And I'll go back here to slide mode. There we go, we're, we're, we're good to go. Okay, great. All right. Um, now, let me go back to where we were here. Okay, so the next track, and there's the tracks, is called Economics Management and Strategy, where we study real bonds uh, that the U.S. government used in World War II and the Russian government used in World War I. Uh, we, we look at how the world works, how interest rates change. Um, we, we look at cryptocurrencies in detail as well. Uh, it's all optional. You don't have to take every class as well, just... Take what's of interest to you. Um, and then um, you get all my books, whatever, as part of this. Uh, and so the gold program, it's over 300 hours of do-at-your-own-paced classes um, on, on these five core topics I just talked about. Um, and then you get a 30-day 100% money-back guarantee, which expires 30 days after we start. So we start December 14th. Uh, and so that, that um, you get 100% money back up until January 14th. 
Um, and then the platinum version is like the gold, except you get three hours of one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, I, I wrote here eight one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, but um, that, that last 20 minutes each, or you can do all three hours in one go, whatever works for you, you, you guys are the customers. And that's why I have a, a, a clock up here because I'm doing one-on-ones with a bunch of my platinum students uh, this afternoon, starting at 1.50 p.m. Yeah. But if you have more questions about the, the MBA degree program, you, you can always ask me here, uh, or you can go to um, Haroon Education, Haroon, HaroonMBA.com. Yeah, and, and thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, next up uh, is, is from Solomon, who's saying, do you have all, did you have everything figured out uh, by the age of 30? No way, man. No way. No, I didn't have anything figured out at 30. Um, I was confused at 30. But I kind of figured things out in my 40s. Um, yeah. So I, I was really insecure in my 20s and 30s. Um, I, I wanted to, I don't know, do things to impress other people, like cars or my job or whatever it was, but I wasn't happy. And if you, if you live your life to impress others, you'll, you'll never be happy. Like with, with my kids, I've never told them that I want them to be a certain profession. I just want them to be them. And, and I want to raise confident, you know, God-loving kids. That's it. I think the best gift a, a teacher or a parent can provide a child uh, is, um, is confidence. Because with confidence, you can do anything. Yeah. I didn't have anything figured out in my life till my 40s. Yeah. All right. Um, and Muhammad is saying, hey, Chris. Hey, man. Do you have any advice on how I can get a job at a hedge fund right out of undergrad? Uh, and is it possible to break into the hedge fund industry without an IV degree? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Um, all you have to do is network aggressively, right? These, these big hedge funds, for the most part, most hedge funds don't even have an elaborate HR division. It's, it, they're, they're very unsophisticated from a personnel perspective. So all you have to do is network like crazy. Read this book. Go to my website, haroonventures.com. Read this book. It's free. It'll help you out tremendously. Uh, and if you sign up for my, my MBA degree program it, it, in the platinum version, I will personally write your entire LinkedIn profile. Yeah. And I'll help you interview as well. Next question is HBS or GSB? Well, I think that two thirds of HBS is BS, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, next up is, is it okay to be open about your faith and religious beliefs or better to keep them uh, to yourself. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying God bless you after you sneeze. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying God willing. I don't think there's anything wrong to tell someone that um, that's had something bad happen to them. I'll, I'll, I'll keep you in my thoughts and prayers. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. You know, a, a lot of people say that to keep religion and politics out of the workforce and, and out of school, et cetera. Um, like, I wouldn't recommend ever following um, a politician on LinkedIn uh, or on Twitter because half the people might not like you as much. I don't know what half. Um, but if, if it comes to religious beliefs, like, wh what I do is... Like I'll, I'm Christian. I'm Christian. I'm, I'm Catholic. Um, if, if, if I say certain things, I make it more universal. Like if, if my students or somebody's very, very worried about something um, and they're worrying too much, you know, I might say something along the lines of, don't worry because God already knows what's going to happen. And that should put you at ease. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But that's just me. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Muhammad is saying, is it possible to be extremely successful in finance if you're an introvert? Yes. Yes. It might hurt you networking wise. Oh, that's my alarm going off. I got to wrap up the call because I got to go to um, MBA degree students only office hours, my, my platinum and gold students and then one-on-ones. 
Um, and, and by the way, if, if there's more, it looks like there's tons more questions. Um, so just uh, save them and then please ask me on my on next week's webcast. Or if you're one of my uh, MBA degree students in the Gold or Platinum program uh, during MBA office hours, which we're going to start in 10 minutes, you can ask me then. Or if you have a one-on-one -on -one with me this afternoon, I got a ton of one-on-ones. Uh, you can ask me uh, during the one-on-one -on -one, uh, as well. But let me answer this last question from Mohammed. Is it possible to be extremely successful in finance if you're an introvert? It's possible. I think it's easier if you network a lot to be successful in finance. Most finance roles are sales roles, actually. And every CEO in finance is a great salesperson. That's how they got there. Can you learn to be an extrovert? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I remember when I, when I was younger and I worked at Accenture, I remember programming for like 10 hours in a row. I had my Jolt Cola in the days before Red Bull. And it felt like 10, like I felt like a couple seconds went by. I was in a zone. I loved it. And then I would go to parties and I feel nervous around people. And what you have to do is you got to run to your fear. Um, you know, if, if you're fearful of public speaking, well, you got to public speak a lot then and, and condition yourself to enjoy it. And I help you with that as well in, in my courses. Um, if you're fearful of, I don't know, you get into an elevator and someone seniors in the elevator and you get kind of nervous, you just got to kind of, I don't know, just tell yourself, I don't give a damn what people think of me. I'm not saying be rude or disingenuous, but as Dr. Seuss said, those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. Uh, but the way I got over my shy phase when I was a programmer in my twenties was I forced myself to go talk to people. Uh, at parties. And eventually I became comfortable in my own skin when I told myself, I don't care what people think of me. Just do you. You be you. You do you. Because people love you for who you are. All right. I want to thank you all for your, your time. Uh, this call within 24 hours, uh, somebody on my team uh, will go through um, all the questions. And in the description field, they will add a clickable index. You can click on any question to go immediately to the answer to any question uh, that I've answered. I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, again, if you're my MBA degree students in my gold or platinum program, I'll see you in a couple of minutes on our, our office hours. And then we got one-on-ones. Um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, my MBA degree programs, please go to haroonmba.com. Um, and you can also ask me more questions next week on this weekly call. If you subscri subscribe to my vlog, uh, I'll see you every day because I release my vlogs daily at 9 a.m. Uh, San Francisco time. Uh, if not, God bless you. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you next Thursday and every Thursday forever, starting at 8 a.m. Thank you. Have a good weekend, eh? Thanks.